Good afternoon. I lost track of time. I want to greet each of you all and welcome you all to um, our monthly workshop, work session that we have um, each month for Wednesday, August 2nd, um, 2023. I can't believe it's August already. And um, I have... I have two pieces of paper, but just one agenda. I was gonna say I got two agendas, but I got two pieces of paper with the same thing. So, okay, we're gonna call ourselves to order. We have a couple presentations today. And first up, um, we got our um, facilities person over there, Ms. Schaefer, welcome. I pres uh, wanna take it that we've got two folks from our Board of County Commission staff. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'm gonna turn it over to you all and let you all have, um, go forward with your presentation here. Much to your certain board yeah. members. Um, this is just an update on current use and future use opportunities for Diamond Sports Park. So, this first part today, we wanted to share with you what's currently going on out at Diamond. Um, our current uh, MOU agreements there, we are in partnership with three different organizations that are providing activities for our elementary and middle school athletes. We are currently working with Gator Ball on an annual renewal option set for November of this year. They provide opportunities for both baseball and softball for our middle school athletes. They also, as part of their agreement, maintain the infields. So we have four central infields now and they share custodial fees for cleaning services for events there. Our second MOU is with I-9. That partnership is uh, for younger children's sports, but it's a wider variety. So soccer, flag football, t-ball, cheer, uh, that agreement, they do a lot of mowing for us there um, and share responsibilities of organizing some of the events that happen outside of our standard school year, so they continue through summer programming as well. And then Gainesville Volleyball hasn't started their programming there yet, but they have an agreement in place that provides space for them to start uh, beach volleyball, sand volleyball, which is a recent addition in the last few years to FHSAA. Uh, girls sport allowances, so there's space for them to do that. Um, they're just waiting on securing some fundraising to move forward with that process. We also just wanted to highlight a couple of the recent events. These have happened within this uh, past school year and over the summer. Gator Ball recently upgraded all four infields, removed all weeds and restructured um, mounds and cleared areas so that that is now in a fully ready for the upcoming season. And then also a uh, school board partnered with Gator Ball to install four new batting cages there. That is the, a partnership with the Rex and Brody Foundation to have that in place. Um, and that is nearing completion now. We have everything done except for the pouring of the concrete around the exterior of those four batting cages. When you said partner, what do you mean? Like we're, they, we uh, have an agreement where we're allowing them to construct it. Did we have to contribute funds to it or did the, the foundation pay for it all? We did some of the groundwork to get the site ready. So we some did some mm -hmm. form, some prep out work, and then they did the actual install of the okay. equipment. Thank you. Good afternoon, chair, board members, and superintendent. I'm Suzanne Wynn. I'm the Director of Planning and Construction in Facilities. One thing I'd like to talk to you about with this 66-acre uh, 66, 66 parcel that we own are the future use opportunities so you're aware of, of our, our potential use. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a 66-acre parcel. It is large enough for a middle high school or a 612 combo school. Uh, we have an interlocal agreement. Our latest agreement is from 2017 that states what our school siting criteria is. This is something that we are in agreement with uh, and working collaboratively with our all of our cities and our Alachua County. And so, um, we also have this information is in the Alachua County Comprehensive Plan. There is a section in there that I've referenced that basically talks about the acreage that's ideal for elementary, middle, and high school. And I've listed those uh, in, in the slide information. 
One thing that I don't have on the slide, but I did pass out to you that I know you've seen before is our annual concurrency report. And I've only copied the pertinent pages. So I copied the cover sheet so you knew which report it was and what the date was. I've, I've captured uh, copies of all of our concurrency service areas for elementary, middle, and high school, okay, so you can reference those. And then starting on page 16, table 5A and 5B, what I'd like to point out to you is, and, and there is a caveat in here, with our rezoning, this, this will change. But for right now, what we're projecting is to have in excess of 100% enrollment in those schools projected all the way through current year through all the way year through year 10 for Buholtz and Newberry. And then if you look, and that's using our total capacity, which includes portables, and it's also in looking at our permanent capacity as well. And as you know, as a district, we're trying to get away from the use of portables as much as possible so we don't overload our core facilities. And then on the next page, page 17, we have the Fort Clark Middle School that's also projected to be over 100%. And as I've mentioned, this will change with rezoning. We'll see what it looks like on the other end of the rezoning effort that we're going through, but I wanted to point that out to you. We have continued growth in the west part of our county west of 75 and around the 75 corridor, I-75 corridor. The other information that uh, Superintendent, Ms. Eunice, and, and other district staff have discussed are the opportunities for a, f a future potential stadium. We're unsure of the citizens' field and stadium future. We don't know what's happening there. The city is having community meetings uh, around that. I think both I did, I think Ms. Schaefer also attended those community meetings. Um, and you're in contact, right, with, with the director. And a future transportation facility site is a potential. I know that's something that's been discussed to move it from the eastern part of Alachua County to a more centralized location, as well as a state-of-the-art uh, sports complex is also a potential. Are these, these are either ors, right? There isn't room for multiple of these at the site. These are either or with, I would say with the exception of a combination, I would think there could be a combination of high school stadium, you know, with some sports facilities. I think that's a potential. Okay. So, but I, th I think that would, it would be good to go through a conceptual planning process for something like that. Um, but that's, those shared facilities, those are the ones that I could see being used in combination. Okay, and at a previous workshop when we discussed a transportation facility site, um, we had discussed that there were previously um, negotiations, discussions with the city for RT, for sharing space with RTS possibly. Is that still a potential? I haven't heard any updates on, on where those conversations are at this time. So I know that was something that Dr. Simon had met a few times and I, I just don't know, you know, with all that's going on with the city right now. If those conversations have continued, I haven't heard that they have, but the city is kind of in a state of turmoil right now a little bit. And so that's, that's all I know at this time. I, I was putting down any potential ideas, you know, just to be thinking about what we could do and not necessarily what we have decided to do. Okay. Are there any other questions before I turn it over to Alachua County? Yeah, um, it feels like we should probably have a long-term plan for that property because coming in and 
um, and doing all of the work that the city is suggest suggesting only to five years later uh, determine that we're going to need a high school there or a middle school, which it looks like a 6 through 12 school could be beneficial on that piece of property. Um, it seems like we need to make decisions about what we're going to do with the property that we have before we can, I don't know if we're supposed to, uh, you know, come up today with a solution for this, but um, it, it seems to me that, that education trumps sports, in my book it does. And so I think it's important for kids when they're going to school to, to, to not be in, in portables if they don't have to and to have a facility that um, shows that we as a board value, and I'm speaking just for myself, value education and we want them to have, you know, really nice facilities. And we know that a lot of our facilities are not that way, so anyhow, those are just, that's just my thought. Um, I think that, I think it would be beneficial to listen to what the county is proposing. They have a few different scenarios, and I don't necessarily think that if we want to preserve this property for a middle-high or middle-high combo school, that it excludes any other potential uses right now. I think there would be a need if we wanted to maintain that as a future potential use that we look at maybe doing some conceptual planning, some big picture, what can we do here and still have the opportunity to do, to build a school in the future should we need it. Uh, again, I don't know what these numbers are gonna look like with rezoning because overall district-wide, we do have seats mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers collectively. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'm not saying not listen to what the city or the county has to offer. I didn't mean that at all. I'm just saying that I would hate for that nice piece of property in southwest Gainesville where we have a need for schools to become a, a sports facility and not in the future, hopefully sooner than later, be able to use it as a school site. Um, so, Ms. Abbott, I, I agree with um, a good bit of what you're saying. And um, when I spoke with with Mr. or well, Commissioner Cornell, he was like, "Y'all want to y'all want to give us a piece of land?" I, I I couldn't blame him for asking because I <laughs> asked them for stuff, and I said, "We can't give you anything. We can't because we the, the intent when they purchased it was that." And as Ms. Wen said earlier about um, the Westward growth. So I agree with you that we ha the need may be there, but I think, and I, I agree 100% that we need to do, like I, I'm in favor of us like forming like a committee uh, so we can have like some long range plan and get some partners from UF, possibly, you know, the county, our staff, us, a couple board members, where we could really like, as in conjunction with our strategic planning, like really plan out facilities and look in the future because that hasn't been done and we can come up with some, ser some, some good plans for short range, medium, and long range, but so much of it, like right now, like where we are, I think we stay open-minded to see what a partnership would be with the county. We really don't know what the impact of vouchers are gonna be with us, you know, in the short term here, but we preserving the asset, you know, cause they're not making any more land. <laughs> so, and we have this piece of property, we've had it on um, the district has owned it for, for a good little few years for a future school that may be needed, but we gotta, we have to do some planning, some, some long range planning um, and map out some, some needs of what we have. I agree that academics is key, but part of, um, having um, an enriching and a positive academic experience does include sports and those activities. And our district, we, 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 want, we owe it to our, our families in the area to have the, um, improve our facilities for sports, I'll just gyms and things. And, and it's gonna be challenging to do that because of the funding um, is gonna be so divided going forward, so. But I, I completely agree with you is that we need to improve our, our schools and we are on path to do, to do that. We just can't improve them all at the same time, unfortunately, so. Um, I, I also just, I hope that the superintendent can open that dialogue with the city. I know the city is struggling, 
but we also have budgetary struggles and perhaps it would be beneficial to both us and the city to pool resources together for transportation needs. Um, and so I think that would be a beneficial conversation to reinitiate. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. McNeil. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Wynn, what about, I know we hear about um, Diamond Sports, but what about the property we purchased? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm drawing a blank. As, thank you, 143rd Street. That property that was purchased is about 37 acres. That would be a parcel that would be big enough for an elementary school or a middle school or elementary middle combo school. So we do, we do own that property and that's, that's another opportunity. It's not large enough for a high school or a combination site like we're, that was mentioned in the future potential uses. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions before we move on? So at this time, I'd like to introduce our representatives from Alachua County, Mr. Maurer, the Parks and Open Space Director for Alachua County, and Mr. Ed Williams, and he is the Capital Projects Coordinator for uh, Alachua County. Again, I'd like to quickly take this opportunity for their assistance with the development at Lake Forest and that, that community park. They were, these, these two are very instrumental in that project happening. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Jason Maurer, Director for Parks and Open Space. Um, again, um, like Suzanne said, we've, we've been working fantastic together, so they, they're a great team and they've been very supportive and um, it's been great having conversations with them about opportunities. So <clears throat> speaking of Lake Forest, that's kind of why we're here today was the success there and not only Diamond, but some potential other opportunities for partnerships. Um, we have a few that we've mentioned in the slides later on, but obviously we'll be open to any other ideas that you might have as well. <clears throat> Let's see. So uh, here we just recently completed our master plan, and we'll, well, this is the overall map showing the needs for the parks that we have in Alachua County to fill the gaps in services. What I did is tried to put a blue star kind of on Diamond to kind of you know, show where it, it falls kind of in there, where we have a park need in that area, and that's kind of where we kind of initiated this discussion was that we we're kind of close in proximity to where we need to fill that gap and then Diamond was there and, and there might be an opportunity to partner on that. So one of the things that we would discuss um, with the potential options and ideas and things that we're just here to present today uh, is be, you know, helping renovate the existing park amenities uh, fields aligned with Latcher County Park Space Master Plan Guidelines, which basically just bringing everything up to our standardization. Um, Public-private partnership to provide competitive level cross-country course for the 2025 Masters event was one of the proposals that they thought might be a good fit for this property. Um, another thing we talked with uh, Suzanne, and she's brought this up already, um, hire a consultant to provide a park-specific master plan to expand the park amenities and recreational opportunities, but that would also include, um, if we were to partner on this, the, the school board and us sitting down and coming up with that conceptual plan of what do we need to have in the long term for the property? Uh, what's already there, the existing footprint? Can we fit schools in and still build around and still have a park option along with the school having their, what they need for the future needs? So the option A that, you know, one of the, the master's event, <clears throat> they wanted to look at this partnership for this was to build a competitive cross country course on the property. And as you can see by the diagram, that course pretty much um, would start up near the front and it would pretty much consume the entire property, the, the non-developed portions. And then there would also be some uh, amenities and some other events that they would try to have on the existing fields as well. And this would be part of that. Um, I think it would have to be done by March of, or for March of 2025. So, the tentative timeline for that would be is the you know, workshop today, then we would have to get into negotiations for the partnership contract, whatever was decided. Um, the 
the cross country course itself would be taken on by a private entity that would fund it, build it. Uh, then the county would maintain it after the fact, and then it could be used for future um, school cross country events and, and, and used for that kind of thing. Uh, but you can see it's a pretty tight timeline. Um, so we would have to go through some design and some other things and include um, to meet that, that deadline there. Um, based on some of the conversations that I've already, the comments I've already heard, I, I, I'm thinking this probably is not going to be an ideal option because it would kind of consume the entire property, um, leaving little little room for potential schools in the future. Um, without unless we built it, knowing we're going to tear it out, so that's that's just something. That Can I ask a quick question because I think the superintendent had this question and uh, a few others. If you built a course that this course, how much actual investment goes into something like this? And is there, I mean, we're not talking about if we need to build a high school, you know, in the next couple of years, it would be, you know, a decade out potentially or more. Can you explain a little bit what would go in into that and that investment? So what I'm understanding is the what have what have been the price they've told me is, is about a million dollars to to build this because you've already got the existing parking and some of the infrastructure that's needed as well, so there would be savings on that part because you've already you're using what you have. Now the course itself like just has to meet certain pri uh, parameters. So <clears throat> like you said, it's not going to be a paved trail. It would be a cleared course, marked and designated. Um, then it would just be a long-term maintenance of you know keeping it maintained, keeping um, you know keeping the, the trail compacted, and making sure that it doesn't get soft and mud holes and things and tripping hazards such as that. Um, but as far as after this event, it would just it would still be considered a competitive level, so it, it could create a lot of like um, you could host state finals things like that. They do that in Leon County. They have a, a phenomenal course up there, but it won't be to that scale but <clears throat> as far as that um long term you, you could like if it's 20 years from now you could say that you probably have gotten your investment back on it and then you could look at it and say look we know we're going to take this out in year such and such to build a school so here is that potential that you still could design your school and infrastructure and things like that and then knowing that this course will be in place and that in the year 20, you know, 20 years from now that we, we would be re removing the course. So that, that is an option as well. So Jason, the, the um, course material construction, is it like, uh, it's not track material, is it? Yeah. Is it just like a regular natural terrain that you got, would go in and you wouldn't clear, would you clear cut the property? No, it or would just, just the path? be whatever the width, uh, do you remember that the width is on that? Okay. So there's a standard width. It has okay. to be. So we would clear that width so that it meets the, the competition criteria, and we would just maintain that. And it would just, well, you would end up seeing a trail develop from all okay. the Okay, so it's more, it is more like a natural trail. It would be completely natural. They wouldn't put any artificial. There would just be some signage and things so that you know, like, loop turn coming up. Or mm -hmm. this is the, you could also designate this as blue loop, red, you know, red loop, those kind of things. And in and, and parks in, in this field, okay, um, given that we want to maintain the property for a future, school, future use, we don't know what, it, and we don't know when, right? I, I can't recall when we bought this. It was before 16, right? Um, what's the depreciation, like the useful life of one of these things? You mentioned 20 years, so is it, it, it 10 years out, we've said the projections based on past information, we're thinking we would be at 100%. That means that we'll have the money to buy to build another school, but um, between that 10 and the, the 10, second 10 year span, would it be like considered like a poor use of tax dollars if we had to go in and know that we were gonna take it out because of the construction of the new school? Uh, I it like, could be conceived that way, yes. And so that's why I think the entity that's hosting the masters is is going to try to get like TDC dollars and things that they and took along with their own. What's TDC? Is that Tourist Development yes. Corporation? Okay. So, so they would like to try to do that to help facilitate the building of this and then the depreciation. On this, I don't, I don't know. That would be kind of an interesting because there's not much actual physical infrastructure. It's more of maintaining it, the integrity of the course and compaction and 
the wear and tear and washouts and things like that. So that I don't know if you'd really lose much on, on that, but it's I think it's just the initial mobilization and the, getting the equipment out and cutting the course, surveying and do due diligence and permitting. That's going to be a lot of the upfront cost, and then the long term keeping it up isn't going to be as much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so the option B that we'll um, go into is pot the potential park improvements on, and when we talk about potential park improvements, we're talking about the the place, the, um, I'm sorry, the part of the park that's already been developed. We're not talking about the uh, uncleared section in the back. So some of the things that we would talk about doing would be is, um, you know, playgrounds, um, sports courts, pickleball, basketball, probably more like a pickleball, basketball combination court, um, pavilions, uh, fitness equipment or trail, additional sports fields. Uh, I think with the original as built, there's a bunch of, you can see where they actually do have like soccer fields planned for along that whole section. So they had that entire front section built out with sports fields and that wasn't even considering the back section that's still left forested. So a potential timeline for option B, uh, today we're presenting um, if, you know, there's a positive wanting to move forward, uh, fall of 2023, we would start negotiating with um, school board staff on what we can do, can't do, what, who's going to be responsible for what, and, and kind of hash out all those details. Uh, I believe it would probably be done sooner, but plan on coming back to the board here and our board in the spring uh, to go over that contract and gain approval. Uh, so then if that was approved, we would we would tentatively uh, assume maintenance of Diamond Sportsplex October 2024. Uh, spring of 2025, we would start with our general park improvements, upgrading irrigation, a lot of the field improvements um, as far as the turf, uh, starting to make some of the initial changes there and then like we talked about we call it a master plan for a park specific but getting the school board at the table with us and starting that conceptual plan process of looking at the entire property and work what can we do if you wanted to do option a with this school option b the combo schools how would they foot fit what would their footprint be and then that would kind of say okay this is where the school's future footprint will be we know we leave that kind of untouched and then we can develop around that in, in conjunction uh, with the school board's uh, access and everything. We would just have to leave the access road and all those kind of things. Um, and then winter 2025, present the master plan to both boards, you know, the final product with the conceptual plans and the, and the priorities and, and, and the final um, timelines of when we can expect these kind of things. And of course, a future school develop, you know, if you don't know when you're going to build the school, we would just have that on there as to be determined. But I think that would give everyone input. That would be the, the ideal if we could use the parcel for this and, and still leave everybody open for future development. Um, so option B does not include the construction of the cross country so that you guys could Correct. host the, ma the World Masters Champion. Well, Correct. World this, Masters Conference. Yes because of the, as you saw with the cross country map, that it, it would be pretty much consuming everything. There wouldn't be any room for development. Um, we would still, you know, looks like the managing, you know, we would still take on the management of the baseball fields and the existing fields. Uh, we just wouldn't be able to add anything else really because of the course. Uh, so we would still be partners in that way of taking on the maintenance and, and improving the ex existing structures. Uh, so potential benefits to um, the students. Um, oh, sorry, Mr. Marsh. Um, Dr. Russell has a question. So with with option B, um, that would not cut into the space where a school could potentially be. Um, would any of the fields, like if we were to build a school there, would would we end up with any shared sports fields that would then be like the schools during the day and open to the public? On weekends, is that the kind of thing we're looking at there? That's a potential. You know, obviously, we we you know there's so many options. We can't commit to one thing or the other. But again, it kind of you could look at the Lake Forest model of like, if the school and the county partnered and built a field that could be used by the high school 
you know, and then when it's not being used by high school, it could be used by youth sports or the public during the weekends when there's not school activities. Can I go back? Yes. I have a question. Let's go back. So we just heard about the existing use and the construction of the batting cages. Mm -hmm. How does option A impact that? That uh, shouldn't impact. They're going to have to work around what's already there. They understand that, and then the batting cages, you know, those are in. We just built some at Jonesville as well. So they would accommodate the course around what's already already on site. So uh, the benefits to the students. So look, we, uh, Suzanne and they've already touched on some of this, but um, provide more open space for the approved high school flag football programs, dedicated open space for middle, middle and high school soccer and lacrosse, uh, open field space for high school intramural sports, expanding athletic programs at the, you know, just in general, uh, intramural or whether they're you know, middle or competitive or what have you. Uh, so adding the additional fields would expand the opportunities for the students to do more uh, intramural sports or have a, a more consistent place or an option if uh, other potential sites don't work out, this would still be a great place for them to still come and, and participate and not lose what they already have. Um, some of the additional partnerships that we were talking about was similar to Lake Forest. Uh, we talked about these are the top three elementary school, or I'm sorry, the two elementary schools and the middle schools that we could look at for potential partnerships like uh, Lake Forest and do something similar there. Um, and of course other, which would be we are open to, you know, the school board's input of like, we really would love this or that, or here we have some ideas of a partnership opportunity. Um, the only one of them I think I believe it's Rawlings. Is that in the city limits? That's in the city limits, right? Yeah, so I think that my only concern would be is that would be more of in the city limits, and that might be a little more of an issue for us, but Shell and uh, Kanapaha would definitely still be uh, something we'd be interested in. Because I know at uh, Veterans Park, we're, we're at capacity there with only two fields, and, you know, it would be great to work out something to where we could use um, the soccer field Napaha for when you know the school's not using it but then have some of these practices could move there or on a weekend when they can have a game over there that way they could have three fields going at once mm -hmm. so, so th there's all kinds of opportunities to partnership um, just questions for miss Wynn I believe with the uh, with Shell Elementary um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about how the capital improvements at the schools in Hawthorne will happen and whether it will just be the middle high school or whether Shell Elementary might be included, perhaps both schools will share a site. I've even heard tossed around, mm -hmm. has any of that been finalized? Because I would hate to partner with the county to build a state of the art playground and five years from now, the school is not at that site. But we are at the point of rezoning and strategic planning, which will lead to the capital improvement plan reevaluation. And so I, I know there's been a lot of ideas tossed around about a lot of different things that haven't been completely vetted, that we have an actual, this is what we're doing in the timeline. What we, what we know right now is we're in construction with Westwood Middle School and we're in with design for Littlewood Elementary School because we have built that transition school that we're leasing portables, you know, for those projects. And that's, you know, and, and then our other capital projects that are, are more of a as needed roofs and HVAC and, and such as that security projects. But the larger capital projects have not been revisited. So one question I had when I was looking at your cross-country track. I know you've mentioned that the GRU property to the north, is there any potential for bringing some of that track, that cross-country track onto that GRU site and maybe not using as much of this property for that? That would be ideal, except that the GRU is not gonna be 
uh, done in time. They're they're not even going to be shovel ready. <clears throat> so that yeah, obviously that would have been like um, Ed and I discussed. If we had that open and we could take some of that course out there, that would make a huge difference. But that's also something that could be looked at as a. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, GRU is doing a wetland <clears throat> recharge to the property to the north. And we're going to partner with them to manage that. So they'll they'll maintain the cells, but we'll do the opening and closing and maintain the you know trails and trash and things. Uh, the original plan was to do a small park up towards the front as well to to kind of hit that niche that we needed. And we were going to do restrooms and playground and pavilion and such. So one of the benefits that if we partnered on this, <clears throat> we can lessen our impact on the Sorry. GRU and actually kind of intertwine the diamond and the GRU to where people could park diamond and kind of go in, which would then make, we wouldn't be putting impervious surface on a stormwater recharge property. But um, that's just not gonna be done in time, but that could be something as potential that once it was done, the course could be redone, rerouted uh, at that time. So that is, that's a good point. So have the plans been finalized and you have to wait till construction is complete or is it still in design phase? They've just started design and oh. we actually haven't even um, gotten the official MOU yet to, okay. to, or signed and everything. But yeah, it's looking more like, and then GRU with their ongoing, they, they keep assuring us the project will move forward. So they're, but they're, you know, like we said, there's still that potential. But yeah, so that's probably going to be about a year after that would be open to the public. We have been involved in their um, early discussions, their sort of pre-planning uh, for that site. And I, I would like to point out to the board that there are some really great educational opportunities there because it is the property that's just due north of this and right across the street from Terwilliger. Um, and, and in the meetings, and we had a, a sort of um, interaction with the stakeholders uh, about two weeks ago where people came out and, and expressed opinions about the site and learned about what was going to be there. And it will be, I think it will provide some really great educational opportunities from an environmental standpoint for the school children across the street. And I'll tell you, a conversation already ensued about how to get the children uh, safely across the street from the from the elementary school to the site. And uh, even one of the ideas that we threw out was tunneling under the road, under Parker Road, so that the children could enter and sort of have a, a really neat educational experience and, and enter the park sort of the way the, the water does. Um, but as uh, Director Maurer said, particularly with option B, um, not impacting the back of the Diamond Park allowing a lot of sort of uh, nice opportunities for expansion for sports courts, playgrounds and things like that on the front. And then also being able to lessen the pervious impact on the GRU wetlands, which is being officially called the Southwest Nature Park now, by the way, um, lessening the impact on the nature park. And it, it could really be a win-win situation for the city, the county, and the school system. So I guess um, we got to figure out which one of these options we want to kind of give staff and the county commission the trigger to go on. We want a tight timeline for A. I know that's a need. Do you have any other spaces that you're looking at to, for, um, to construct the course so that you could host the event? I, I believe they were uh, looking at the possibility of, uh, I believe it was Meadow, the Meadowbrook golf course that's gone, that they've allowed to kind of, I think that's up for sale, but I don't know if that's gained much traction. Um, again, that would still, for them to be a tight timeline by the time you close, do all your due diligence and everything. That's the only other option that I've heard. Um, you know, West End would obviously be another spot, but I think the asking price is just too much right now, so. So I guess to my colleagues, I um, for, if you all have any input, I, for, for me, I like, I want to partner with the county and I want to be able to do something where we could help them to be able to host the World Games. Um, it's not, we're not giving them the property, we still maintain use of it. Um, we, if, 
if that GRU thing kind of clears itself up later and they're able to reroute the course so they can free up the back end of Diamond, we could still hopefully be able to do both. I'm just trying to figure out a way um, in my head that we can get to yes to OK staff to bring back a contract so they can get to where they need to be while still um, us maintaining um, the asset for future use. And I think all of these options do that. It's just a, a matter of going and we don't know. So I'm not sure what you're, what anyone else's feedback, Dr. Rockwell, I see you're like. Um, what kind of revenue would you expect from hosting the games? Like, will that bring in a lot of money to the county? Are we, because as we talk about this, our biggest concern is you putting out an investment of a million dollars and before your 20 year timeline that you talked about us potentially needing that space and we don't want to let down taxpayers but but what's the what what kind of revenue will come in from hosting this and hosting potential future events is it is it possible that it would still be a benefit to the taxpayers to make this investment well i will i can assure you the bulk of the revenue they're going to generate is going to be out of the celebration point facility that's where the the majority of the track and field events are gonna be held. <clears throat> so that, I think, is gonna be where the big boom is. This is just part of the, to, to host, you have to have this. Um, so a long, long term, I, I think it's more, it'd be a benefit for the, the, the high school cross country programs. It, it gives them a home course to, to go, a consistent place to go, and, you know, and a, and a a viable, nice place. I mean, a, a very like this might be a place where they could host host the state states and stuff like that. Is there is cross country state separate from the regular track and field? So it's a separate competition. Okay, yeah. that's an advantage because I don't think we have. Um, I remember a few years ago, Dr. McNeely probably remembers when um, GHS was trying to host or bid for the. And they, we couldn't because they just couldn't work it out because of the lack of facilities. And so our our um, our programs here kind of don't ever get that opportunity to be able to do that. And that's a big revenue generator there for bed tax. And also, when you told me that TDC dollars, that's why I asked what that was. I think there has to be some threshold to meet to even be able to draw down that do those dollars. Is that correct? Yes, they would. Yeah. They have to go separate to them as a private entity and all that. But I think it's only up to 500000 But I, th I think they're, yeah, so they're, they're trying to make this work. Um, okay. So they're generating money from different pockets. So, okay. You have anything else, uh, Ms. McGraw? You have any any input or any any feel on this of how we would? I'm just thinking about, uh, you know, cross country. You know, that's one sport. My my thing is, um, is and you made me think of that more when you mentioned Celebration Point, um, where all of those would be hosted. And so, me, I would look at option B because it offers a more variety. Um, for all of our, you know, students to have potential opportunity. So I would look more at option B. Uh, I hear about um, it's just one sport, and I don't know if I'm totally sold on just, you know, one sport versus an option B. Look like you, the, I like the potential park improvements. You got it all playground sports with basketball, pavilions, and more of a, com a community feel for me. Yeah, and I think you could look at, um, you know, the expansion of youth football programs having multi-purpose fields on the property that would kind of where the cross country to the to the north goes between the property line and the baseball fields. You could put some football slash soccer fields there, and then you could have like youth football out there, youth soccer, uh, or at least they could practice there and then go play their games wherever. So instead of having to drive all the way into town for practices or games, you could have some of those out there as well. Yeah, because now that we, we do have Celebration Point already, mm -hmm. people are feeling that they're left out. You know, they don't have the opportunities kind of tied up by others. And I think that when we look at things and they're going to benefit the community as a whole, um, option B just makes more community sense. Dr. Rockwell, you have anything else? I'm just going to go down um, the thing there. So I'm, you don't have to speak if you don't. But yeah, I I'm, I'm just really kind of weighing um, if things go through with GRU and you've got playgrounds there and then you can reroute 
the course and we can potentially add fields. It just, I, I guess I feel like we're very rushed and I know that's, it's a very rushed timeline and we don't really, um, we don't know if the GRU thing will pan out or not. Um, and so, you know, I really, I like the idea of option A and being able to host this event and bring in money to our community and potentially host future events that will bring in money to our entire community. But I, I'm not convinced from the standpoint of the people living in that area because um, when, when you kind of look at the new construction that's taking place in that area, it's a lot of single family homes, people with young children. And so um, even though I can see the benefits of option A, I, I also lean toward option B just because it seems like it has more benefits to more people. So I, um, I think the GRU property that the GRU project will happen. It's just the timeline. It's my my if I understood, um, Mr. Is it Maurer Maurer with the M? I want to keep want to call you Bauer. Mr. Maurer was saying um, they just can't get through the approval thing with that. So I think that is going to happen, and I think we um, the G, it's just the timeline is is correct. So we coming to us to the school district. It fits into them being able to kind of get going with it and then being able to readdress it, I think, later. The GRU property and that conservation thing will happen. It's just not on the timeline for the world thing, world thing. And so. I mean, financially, is it is it feasible to readdress it? Like if you invest a million dollars into this track, are, is it, will it get rerouted? You know, I, I don't know. I think for the masters, you know, it would be, let's say if we went with, uh, option A, <clears throat> the masters, it would be as is. After the masters, I think it would be open to rerouting. Um, the other thing you could consider is if you st if you still went with option B, cross country course still could be an option down the road. It just wouldn't be an option for the masters. Like if GRU comes on board, we could still look at that partnership of potentially putting in a cross country course for few, you know, for the schools and saying, hey, we could do this and we can make it work and still have a high school and a middle school on the property. So that is still something that is a potential option for, for um, the, the, the cross country later down the road if we decide not to go with the, the option A. So just, just keep that in mind as well. Um, Ms. Ms. Abbott. So after the course is created, who maintains it? So the the... I, ideal situation would be is we'd still partner and so we would maintain it. So we would just initially take on the maintenance of the course once it's completed. Then we would phase in taking on the maintenance of the baseball and the other amenities that are there so that we could allow that to be used by the community uh, during non-school hours and things of that nature and still provide some improvements uh, for, the, for the surrounding communities. And so this question is probably not for you, but like what are our expenses for Diamond Sports Park? I know that in some of the presentations we co-maintain uh, with different partners. So like on an annual basis, what are we paying to keep Diamond Sports Park moving the way it is right now? Do we know? I don't have an exact number, but um, currently we have a uh, uh, Point five allocation custodial. custodial position there, so we have personnel. Um, and then whenever there is something that needs to be repaired, so going through the facilities team or maintenance team to have repairs done is our out-of-pocket expense right now. You so filled in some sinkholes a few weeks ago, a few months ago, maybe a month or so ago. Sinkholes? Filled in some sinkholes. Did you say, we, did you say about staff, your allocation for... Point point five. Five. Custodial. And are we paying, you know, lighting, electric, plumbing, like water and sewer, are we paying for that at that facility too? I think um, I saw something recently and I didn't bring it with me um, that we received that had um, some expenses for Diamond. 
that was on it. The board yeah, that I, I remember it too. Yeah, yeah I can't remember the dollar amount. I can't. I can't remember the dollar amount, but I, I I actually just put my hand on it like like last week when I was going through some budget stuff. So maybe we could probably just get that, but I don't. Um, I can't recall. It was was some stuff, and we do have um, the the Gator baseball and those. I think they pay something. We get some revenue from that to kind of defray that. Um, the cost of the operations. And, That's um, something that we could probably get from Mr. Molander. Yeah. I think we already have it. It's already come to the board. We just can't read. I, um, but yeah, that would be good to have. I, for um, for me, I'm a, Dr. McNeil, I see, are you done, Ms. Fabian? No, I, I was just gonna say, and so for me, you know, we're providing the property here. And I know that for the middle school baseball, Every time I go there, because I have a grandchild that plays, I'm paying five bucks. So they're making money off of that. So mm. it just kind of bothers me a little that we're having to pay anything to a company that's, that's it's not affiliated with the school. So it's not like a booster program where it's going back into the school. It's going back into this company. And I don't know if they're a nonprofit or not. But if we're providing the property, I don't think we should have to spend a lot of money to maintain that property when they're collecting income for it. You mean at Diamond, mm -hmm. uh, you're participating there? So um, I can't answer sure, I'd that. like to add one thing. Yes, There's sir. also a tower on that property. I don't know if it's been considered, but it's also a generating revenue as we speak. I think that was on the document that we received, the cell tower um, that. So um, the Gator Ball, so you say you would pay that mission, and I guess they're probably using that to recoup, to cover the, the fee that they're paying for whatever. So like, maybe we have to look into that um, and how that is. Um, I would say on any given night when I'm out there, and sometimes it's... It's a lot of people. There, there are five or 600 people out there at $5 a pop. That's, that's a significant amount of money. Uh, to be getting just on the one night that I'm there. So I, it's just that, you know, we're, we have a budget, it's, you know, we, and we need to cut back wherever we can, and we have, we have properties, and I have no idea what what's gonna, we're going to do with these properties, and I'm sure, I hope it's going to be part of the strategic plan that we plan what we're going to do for it. Right. But, you know, for me, and I think sports are important. My kids participate in sports, cross country especially. And so I think that's important. I think it's a healthy... Uh, part of developing a kid, especially in middle school and, and high school, they need that. But, you know, I, I'm hesitant. I wouldn't want to be in a 20-year commitment that we're going to leave that, that thing there. And I'm sure that could be negotiated during the contract, the time, but I would, I would not want to commit that property for 20 years to be used as a park. I don't, I don't think the commitment is for that. All of the agreements that we have, um, it is like it's probably a minimum of, of time period, but if the school district needs it, like the ones I've seen, we have to give notice and then we use the properties that we have. So it's not we're committed on the hook for 20 years. C please correct me if that's not the case. We, we have various, uh, I, I've seen some agreements that have been very, very long term. So it's really it's really negotiating the terms and one thing that I think we would need to know if you if we were going down this route would be where is that break-even point for That's the county to do a rerouting you know because that would be I would think that would be the minimum term that they would want you know just Right. That's why, that's why I was asking what were the what was that the yeah. cost and how that second 10-year period if it was that um, of that, that's the, the break-even point of where And then I think that would, you know, once that's determined, it would be a matter of, you know, is that what we would want to do and is that what they would want to do? Um, is, so am, is this something that the county has committed to that is definitely happening or do you need to secure the facilities, including the cross-country track, in order for the masters to happen? It, yeah, they have to have the cross country site for the masters. So, it's my understanding, they ha that's part of the condition. You have to have it. Yeah. Um, but I do know from the county perspective, they w for the amount of investment, they would want to look at a long term lease. Obviously, in this situation, especially um, even if you didn't do cross country, if we were going to invest wild spaces and expand and all these, I mean, they would be looking at a very long term lease. Um, but again, that would sit with the agreement being the back half saying the school board, this will be a future school, I still think it's a, it could be a win-win. 
you know, as long as we show that footprint, the schools can still get what they need and we still can do what we need to up in the front. So I, I do know that that's going to be the, the, the one kicker for us is having a long-term lease. But I think there is an, uh, we're, we don't know about transportation facility potential. You know, there's a lot of unknowns, you know, so um, is so there... I hadn't heard of Diamond being used as a transportation. I, I heard of something more central, like in the, the Terwilliger area Terwilliger, is what I yeah. heard, because yeah. they were saying that was middle of the county, mm -hmm. and the hub is there. It's closer to a lot of the arteries, the main arteries of um, the county. If we put the transportation like way west, I think, in my view, it puts us kind of in a, I don't say a bind, I don't know the right word for it, but it puts, it makes us have the same challenge that we have now by having it so far east. But sending buses out from the west to get east is a lot more challenging than sending from east to west because you have a little bit freer tra travel until you get to, I'm gonna say 62nd, till you get around the mall, mall area, mm -hmm. or for sure Tower Road. That's where it definitely starts to get real um, dicey. Um, yesterday I had my little challenge coming in, Monday, coming in for master board, I was telling them, I was like, man, it's not even the first day of school, and it's like, I had to find another route to get off of Newberry Road, because it was, like, bad. <laughs> I mean, it was bad. It was after 8, before 9, and it was still, like, the traffic was backed up um, to, the, um, what's the, the Tioga, the commercial side of Tioga, right in there? At 8.15, it was backed up there. It was stopped. I don't know if it was a wreck or whatever. So I had to, once I got past her, I had to, like, turn off to try to get, um, get, get in. So, yeah. So I guess, like, um, Dr. McNeil, I, I see your light on. I'm going to let you speak. All of us have spoken, and you hadn't. So I have one more question, too, Madam Chair. Okay. To Let's get Dr. McNeil, and then I'll come back. Okay. I'm um, Madam Chair. Thank you to the team from the county. Um, I'm totally supporting you with this. Um, I have heard Mrs. Um, not to. I always call you Ms. Teresa. Miss Wynn. Miss Wynn. Wynn. I am so sorry because you are definitely not Miss Burlingwood. Um, Miss Wynn, in her um, mm -hmm. expectations, with a future school possibly, um, but I liked what you said um, that you could revert if we had some type of lease stating that um, you would be, your team would be willing to do that. The reason I am in favor of option A because of what you need to have in order for 2025 to happen. And in speaking with some people um, thinking about this opportunity, I think it's a great opportunity for our community, our county, to be a part of the master event. Now, I don't, since I asked about 143rd Street, I know there is no option because you don't have enough land to do the um, cross country course. And because I love track and feel like I love football, I am um, all for going with, if it was for me, it would be option A. And in as much that you are going to manage and take care of the property, that was one thing I was thinking about. But when I heard you say that is going to happen, then I would stick with option A, but I would still want that written in sure. bold black pen ink <laughs> that that's going to happen. Um, I know there are a lot of things that we want to see on this side of the community, and I think those things might happen if city commission can get themselves together. But because we come to you quite frequently for help, in, and we will still come frequently if we do this, I want to be on record to say I don't want any holdback. 
I want a team, and that we are going to partner some other places. So thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. McNeely, Ms. McGraw. Yeah, and, and we also talk, it talks about um, hiring a consultant. Do you have a cost? I mean, have y'all had discussed that at all? A cost it's, it would be? It, it's kind of hard to ballpark, but you 50-ish? Estimate? Yeah, I would say for a project of this size, I would estimate somewhere between fifty and hundred thousand dollars for the consultant, and we would be in design for anywhere from six months to a year, and that would involve some community feedback sessions. One thing I'd like to mention is the consultant that would be hired in my mind. We would want an architect involved, not, a, not just a civil engineer that would be designing parks, but we'd want an architect involved that could do some master planning for school facilities. Mm -hmm. And you know, typically, it would be civil engineer for the most part with park facilities. That would be something I would suggest with coming up with a conceptual or master plan, uh, just for our best interest. And one question that I did have, Dr. McNeely, you touched on it. Is it potential? Is there a potential to use that 37 acres for this kind of scenario? For the maybe kind of combo the cross country track on that site with option B on this site? Has has that been considered? I uh, I just don't know all your like property size needs, et cetera, for this kind of scenario. I, th I don't think that the 37 would work for cross country. It's it. This is squeezing it in as it is. It's traditionally 70 acres is a minimum. 70. Oh, okay. Okay. Were you were you talking about B on the smaller site or cross country? On no, I was talking about cross country on yeah, the smaller that. site. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, now for us to do a sportsplex somewhere like this, we you know we could do we could do that you know on the smaller site. But I think what the benefit for us was <clears throat> bang for our buck, you know, and, and every, you know, we've got so many people that have needs that this is already a structures that are already in place, and many of these are already in place, that we can come in and, you know, we can provide, you know, it, for us to build something like this, buy the land and build it, it would be millions and millions of dollars where we can sink, you know, 1.5 into this and redo the fields and add some other things in there and, and provide some other courts and, so it saves us and get, you know, we can bring these facilities up to a higher level, not that they're bad now, but, you know, just kind of improve whether we go with synthetic turf for the baseball or something like that that's more of a long-term benefit to everyone that's, you know, going to make it a premier facility. Those are the kind of things that we'll figure out during the planning process. So. Uh, you have any? Um, so that, that, Con that planning process with the consultant, like if, if we did go with option A and did cross country, all of that would not happen or would happen with future, with different sites in mind, like? So we would move, so with the cross country, we would need to move forward quickly. Right. <clears throat> so um, that's all gonna be done by the private entity because they can expedite that process. They'll have to do permitting and all that. But you can see, um, I think it was uh, October 2024 is when we would start doing more of the design engineering and um, we would start the, the, the long-term development pro concept, conceptual plans, knowing the course is going to go ahead and go in, but then we would go ahead and start that same type of process to the, the long-term design what we need to do with, with the property. I think it's just with the timeline with this, it's just, yeah, where the course would have to move forward right away. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with, I, I hear what my colleagues to my left say about the um, having more variety with option B. I go, I'm, I'm leaning towards A because it does help the county host the, the world's masters, but also our county doesn't, we have facilities where we could host baseball and other amenities like the park in Newberry and then we have the fields the, at Jonesville Park for soccer 
more fields there. So we have like some other things in um, Citizens Field when it's not football season, they do a lot with the Pop Warner or whatever that the younger students, uh, younger kids with football. But the high schools um, don't have like a facility where they could we could do anything with track. So the the county sports complex, I don't know if the school district would try to host something there because we don't have indoor track as FHSA. I think it's different, right? And um, but the cross country, if that does give the schools, um, Buholtz and GHS and Eastside an option, you know, our district a chance to try to build bid on a state championship. I think that is really, really, that's good for us. And we haven't had to, and we've had um, state championship level athletes from Santa Fe, GHS, and Buholtz. And I'm not sure about Eastside, but I know those three schools we've had. Um, We've had, um, and I'm sure Eastside with um, the field, some of the field events I know they have, but I don't know about the cross country and running. So that's why I lean towards eighth. One is um, for, to help the county bring in that particular event. And, and the, type, the timeline is short because of, they just found out about it like, I, well, I just found out about it like a month ago. Um, and they came to us and us being able to, this is kind of like a model that's being used around co-locating facilities between governmental agencies and, and us partnering together. And as Dr. McNeely has said, the county has been a very good partner with us, and the school district, and helping us to stretch our dollars that we haven't had to, you know, in the, in the past. So, and I, so I guess I'm, I'm asking us to, what can we do to help them be able to host this World Masters event. That's why we're like here now, so. I'm wondering what the acceptable time, line, time frame for the lease period would be. Mm -hmm. What would you consider reasonable? Because I've heard the county say that it would need to be very long term. Define very long term. 20? I heard 20. Probably, probably minimum 50. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, okay, B. Probably with. <laughs> No, that's probably what they're going to come yeah. back with. No, ma'am. But that's probably more if you're investing in all the everything. You know, the World Masters, I can go back and say, look, 20 is more manageable for them. So, I mean, that's obviously, you know, open for negotiation. But And, I mean, I want to say, like, I don't have a super strong feeling one way or the other if if what the county really needs right now that will benefit our citizens the most is option A. I'm open to that, but I feel like the lease term needs to be 15 to 20 years. 50 with a track that takes up our entire property is just not doable. Sure. Yeah, that, and that's great. That's all I need to know so I can go back. And, and so we're in a workshop, so we can't vote. So, and there's a timeline. So how are we proceeding? Because I haven't said ARB. And so I just want to know, like, what is the protocol for this? Because we cannot take a vote on whether or not we're going with this, so is it just our conversation that allows them to go back and start planning on this? Because no, they would bring something. Go ahead, go ahead Mr. Attorney Dwayne. Sure, um, I think the county could take the information that we share today. I've got a couple of questions, if I may, Madam Chair, yes, along those lines. Attorney Dwayne. Um, but to address your point, Ms. Abbott, uh, I think the county's going to have some conversations with their team. They could share that with the superintendent. The superintendent could bring a recommendation for the board. Um, could be A or B or, or C or D maybe that comes out of those conversations. And the board could consider that. They could alter it during a meeting, you know, and, and adopt something different. Okay, um, thanks. It, in terms of timelines, you know, I'm wondering if we could also be looking at renewable periods in 10 years, Evaluate again at 15, evaluate again at 25. Um, so I, th I think that certainly would probably be helpful for the discussion. And I almost feel like I, I need to request a little citizen input on this as a former cross country runner myself. So not as the board attorney, um, the, really just for information for the board. There's a lot of overlap between track and cross country. Cross country is a fall sport, track is a spring. Um, so you get a benefit, just like you have a weightlifting program to make your football team better. Um, there's a lot of that between track, soccer, and cross country. Um, and this would probably be a community amenity in terms of just people going out for a nice shady place to run, maybe while their kids are you know, at baseball practice. 
Is that what we buy property for? I mean, our job is to educate kids. I, and, and so I, I. It was bought, when, do you know when Bowman was bought, 06? I, I don't know. I know it was, it was quite a few years ago with the intention of a high school. Yeah. Madam Chair, if I may, um, Plan B, what was the price Plan tag on B. that? You said one million on Plan A, roughly? That's kind of what they've told us, what they think it's gonna cost to put the cross country in, but that's not including. Correct. So it's one million-ish. What about Plan B? What's that estimate? Well, that's dangerous because you know how inflation is, but I would say over the course of re renovating fields and playgrounds and things like that, 1.5 to two. And I would um, share that, yes, I think with the, the term of very long-term lease, I think it, it makes sense. Um, I concur with what Mr. Delaney had mentioned, 10 years, that's about how far out we could probably really look with our growth, the way it's going out west, you know, and how we're gonna use those 37 acres as well as this 66. So I think that's one of those things that ties into our half cent capital outlay plan that we're gonna be working on with the strategic planning. Uh, with the cross country trail, that's mainly land clearing, like you said, and then surface work, right? A lot of stump grinding and, because we had a cross country trail out at Lofton. I don't know if you ex explored that, but we used to have a cross country trail that our kids ran on at, at the Lofton uh, high school complex in the back. And so um, that might be something we want to explore too. So we used to go out there and run, run meets. Uh, it's, should be, it's probably overgrown, but somewhat cleared. Uh, as far as a, a possible property use that's already in place, a lot of acreage out there. So I think that's something that could at least be looked at. Because how large is that parcel? Do you know that off the top of your head, Miss Wynn? The Lofton complex? And then I would say, if we're going with plan A, you know, what opportunity is there for our cross country teams, our track and field to run concessions and income for their booster clubs and stuff like that. So, you know, that's getting ahead, but at the same time should be part of the conversation now. Are the opportunities gonna be there for our programs to raise money out there? Cause we're talking about non-revenue sports in our school district that we would like to see um, some benefit coming back to their programs um, that they participate in. So. Uh, don't disagree. A lot of FHSA fields could be, um, uh, uh, competitions could be held there. I think that's why we do need a, a state-of-the-art football, soccer, lacrosse stadium <laughs> facility in Alatra County so we can pull it in all right here to go along with Celebration Point and all the things we're doing, right? And I think that does take county, district, chamber, all of us coming to go, uh, you know, coming together. But we're the, we're in the right location in the state for everybody to travel to us. So, um, but that being said, I just wanted to share those comments. Thank you. Well, and that's, that's something too, it's, it's a possibility depending on now. I don't know if that location is ideal for like if that, if you wanted to have a state of the art or if you want it closer to town. I, I don't know. Um, across the country, I think infrastructure-wise, you've got to have X amount of parking, you got to have restrooms, you get, there's a lot of other things. I think that's why Diamond kind of scored high. Uh, or the other other place you're mentioning we can look at, but I don't, I don't know if it will meet that criteria. But during the conceptual planning, if it is determined you wanted to do a high school out there and that they are gonna put a stadium in those, you could always plan the footprint of where the stadium's gonna go and that could always be built sooner rather than later, like you said, with the partnerships and things that, again, it's another potential, not saying it will happen, but it's one of those you could do that and still have future for the school and then that stadium and track and lacrosse and football could all be on that field there. Um, but that's that's just, again, down the road, you know, it's, it's another option, so. Do, um, so I think you, we've heard that if we could, from our attorney, the renewable leases, break even point for cost of option A. Um, I think there's consensus on entertaining B if A can't be worked out, but you know, you've heard that we do wanna maintain the, 
the space for future use as a school. Right. And if there's any way we could do all do that, do A with that, and all work out the the leasing terms or whatever that could be amenable to both organizations. But do you do you think you have enough where you can go back to um, your to Ms. Peoples and the staff at the county to then come back to Mr. Andrew? We meet yeah. the first and third Tuesday. Um, we could have a special meeting, but um, the, our regular meeting dates are first and third Tuesday. If there's something that has to be um, brought back to the board, but yeah, I'll I'll get with um, Ms. Peebles after this and <clears throat> tell her about you know the the big issue right now is probably going to be the lease uh, term, and then I don't I just can't speak intelligently on the life life and break even on across country. That's that's I think it's different. harder to do that, yeah. you know, with it, but uh, you know, the infrastructure costs that you're putting in for the surveying and the study, the architectural fees and all of that, I think that's recoverable. The, the one good thing is it's not like surface put down. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, yeah. like concrete and all that stuff like that. It's not that in any, the restrooms and amenities will probably be built outside of that. Um, so it's a little bit different. So for me, that's why I was like, well, hey, well, we just gonna put a track there and we just have to, we reroute it later but well the other the other benefit too is that with the course being in during the off season after the masters whatever you can still make like disc golf can can intertwine with that you can have like he's you know nature trail people can walk on it run on it and be maintained you could also do you know allow mountain biking or something like that if somebody like off-road biking not like it's going to be the undoing but you know for the communities over there so that you get multi-use out of it when it's not being used during the because uh, disc golf would be able to incorporate a course with that very easily so that you could do that and then of course they know when there's an event going on they would make sure that they if they had to pull baskets or anything like that they do that but i'd like to answer a few questions that right. you had yes. 2003 mr burkett informed me is when we acquired diamonds this is about three years <laughs> And to answer Superintendent Andrews' question, uh, Lofton has 159 acres, so it's quite a large parcel of land. And one thing I also wanted to point out with option A is it looks like you are proposing new park amenities as well in option A, not just the cross-country track, correct? Yeah, it would be limited, though. I mean, like, as you can see, we'd be able to put some amenities in, like a playground or something, um, but we wouldn't be able to add a whole lot, as you can see by the map. Okay. Thank you. Well, I... I think that is, is that it? Um, Mr. Maurer, you have everything you need? Any other questions or anything else you and your? No, I, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, Ms. Peebles did kind of get back to me. She said the 15 to 20 is probably a doable, you know, or however we work it out, but they're definitely open to that time range. So I think it's not a deal killer, let's say. Okay. So, um, but yeah, I think with the cross country, if that's the route we go, uh, it, again, she, she'll get, what she needs in a row and get and get get with back with you. Okay. Yeah. Twenty years we've had diamond then. Yeah. I thought it was 06. I don't know why I was thinking it was two thousand six, but in that frame, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Um I have a question for you, but I'll call you I'll get with you after our workshop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Wynn, for helping to um, facilitate that in the additional info and concurrency. We'll move along. Our next item is we're going to have an update from on resign from Dr. Edwards. I don't hear you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, so comprehensive rezoning, um, more or less uh, just so you all know, the reason that I had to step out was related to comprehensive rezoning and so it is what we really need to discuss today. We have certainly um, had meetings and um, Ms. Moore, the manager in our student Office of Student Assignment has been working with DRMP. Um, the 
project manager um, for rezoning through that company was on maternity leave. And so she's been working with a team of individuals um, and has been working on making the changes with lines. We've had an opportunity, she and I, to meet, to look at lines, to look at where shifts are happening with um, actual families and um, some of the proposed numbers and estimates. Um, and we've also met with um, Dr. Atria, Mr. Andrew, um, Ms. Moore, and myself related to um, magnets, what the caps are, and how those things will impact the shifts that have taken place. However, um, I, I stepped out because we are in preparation for the new school year on August 10th, and right now the zoning office is inundated, um, probably beyond what it has been in the past with calls and things. And so um, Ms. Moore has been working over time. Uh, she's been working nights, weekends, trying to balance the um, additional work that is taking place um, with staff in the uh, zoning office as well as what's happening with the rezoning plans. And um, as she has been doing that, she's still been maintaining and we're still preparing for August 16th. However, when we looked at the most recent data update, which she just received, the numbers do not um, reflect, they bring questions. So for instance, if we were to move um, a particular students from out of a particular con, uh, uh, complex, and you know we move 100 students from that complex, and we started with 50, we shouldn't now have, or we, I'm sorry, we started with 150, we shouldn't now have 75, right? Like, so when we start looking at that, we wanna make sure that the data set that we have is accurate, that the numbers are reflected appropriately, and there are some um, concerns about that. And so we still believe that we can move forward with our project manager coming back and meeting the 16th deadline. However, the concern that exists right now is being able to update all of that documentation a week before the 16th. So our um, expectation is that all of the um, information requested with the numbers and the lines for the maps can be produced by the 16th but being able to have that documentation available to give to the board and making sure that it's accurate and for the community to review one week prior to that would be problematic. We also know that it would be problematic to shift beyond that given what the timeline is for everything. So I want to share that with the board and to um, get feedback um, as it relates to that because I know that the documentation piece is important and for the community to be able to view information. The documentation piece you're talking about is like the text that's um, around each of the zones that outline the text, is that what you're saying? Is that what so you're when we are doing our presentations to do the upload so people can see like the lines, that would be presented before we actually did the presentation to explain it. But we can have that presentation by the 16th to have it a week prior to would be really pushing it because school opens next week and right now, she is the only person who is doing the lines and so also managing zoning is creating a hardship because the numbers are not what we expect for them to be. When we have questions about those, what we don't want to do is present numbers to the community and then find out that those numbers were erroneous. Um, Dr. Rockwell. Um, so I think when we set the timeline for rezoning, there isn't like a state statute that's, you know, other than our general rulemaking timeline, it's not like the trim calendar where we have to have our millage and budget approved by X date. We have wiggle room in that, you know, there is a, there is the potential option to shift the entire timeline by one week or two weeks. Um, I know that would create a lot of work for communications department because we've been advertising a timeline, but I personally think that it's really critical that the community, if we want community input on these things, the community needs to see them with enough time to analyze them. And as board members, if we're going to be voting on things, you know, I think it's really critical that we have our supporting documents a week ahead of time. Um, I know it's not always possible. Sometimes the state doesn't get us information we need, like for the budget, <laughs> in time for us to have those in advance. But whenever possible, you know, I want to make the best decisions. So I want to have time to review materials and I want to have the public to have time to review them and give me their input so I can consider that in decision making. So I, I don't want to be pushing timelines again and again and again, but um, 
if we have good reason, I am open to pushing the timeline once to make sure that we have all of our information in order to make good decisions. And um, let me get Ms. McGraw and I'll come back and say it. Go ahead, Ms. McGraw. So when you say in the documents, because our timeline, we were supposed to present maps. Is that what you're speaking of? The, yeah, where the lines are for us, where we would shift them on the 16th so that we would do that presentation. And then after that, we would have those meetings that have been established for citizen input so that they could share after we've shared the lines and where um, schools, where students in particular areas might potentially be rezoned for, they would be able to see that based on the lines. And so um, if the numbers, however, if we are taking students from neighborhood X and Y and we are moving um, them to another zone, and then we get the feedback back from the company, like when we, this most recent um, output, it did not match. And so the question becomes, why doesn't it match? It has to be accurate. And so um, with that, we have concerns about going ahead and moving forward on the 16th and doing that because we don't want to tell people that you would be zoned for school X and Y, and then in reality, it becomes you know, Z. Um, yeah, because when you're saying, okay, when you're saying we can still have the presentation, what would, what would you be presenting? So she, That's what I'm trying to make sure. I don't want us to put maps out there that may not be correct, but then you're saying still having a so presentation. One of the things is that, you know, she, currently we're, you know, we're working with a team and, um, and they have been fabulous. I think probably the most experienced of the team, though, has not also been present. And she is returning next week, and that is where we have had some experience working through that process before. And I think being able to have clarity about where maybe some of these things might have popped up, the rationale behind why, we might have opportunities to make sure that that's all clean in next week. And if we work through it and we still do nights, we do the 12th, 13th weekend, we can still by the 16th present those lines we won't be able to do that though by the 9th, right? Like, so that's this coming week. We know we can't get that to you in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it becomes really important for us to make sure that that documentation is presented to the board and the community before we're doing it in the presentation, then we may need to shift the date. If it is such that as long as we can still present it on the 16th, but we know that we're not having that documentation in advance, then we need to know that, and so that's why we're bringing it um, before you. This is literally brand new information. It is why I stepped out. It is why I called for Dr. Atria to step out. Mr. Andrew has not even been privy to this. Um, this is in the communication that I was having with Martha. Um, and so I went over to go and talk to her about what steps we needed to take um, and where we were, so. Madam Chair, if I may, can I? possibly provide a little clarification. As a linear thinker, I'm, I'd like to look at dates, right? So as you know, you have the workshop on the 16th. What Dr. Edwards is referring to is our goal was to provide you the information for that workshop a week ahead. We can't do that given the issues that Dr. Edwards just talked about. We can, however, provide you that information sometime on the 14th, which only gives you really two days to look at it before the workshop. It would still be provided on the 14th. The public would have time to look at it before their first input session. The restriction would be in the time that you all would have to digest it before the workshop. So perhaps we could move the workshop. It doesn't change our timeline for public input and then therefore allow the board more time to review that material and have to make sure it's accurate because the workshop is the 16th, right? Yeah. Correct. And, and I'm correct in saying if we move that and rescheduled it, let's say a week later, but or whenever that is, the that that will not affect our timeline. Is that right, Ms. Johnson? The f right. I see the first input session. Yeah, the problem is our first uh, uh, public input session is scheduled for the 21st. 22nd, 22nd, excuse me. 22nd, and then we have another one on the 24th that week. So 
receive this in love. <laughs> I, I guess like I was sitting here like scratching my head because we don't usually get, we have, we have there have been some material we have not gotten um, received seven days in advance of the meeting. Correct, but we- And I'm trying, and I'm, so I'm like, I, this is very important, right? This is important. And, but before zoning, we ha there's a lot of times we don't get info seven days in advance. We can right. put on the and, sixth. And that has been a concern that you have experienced. It, it is a serious concern. Our discussion was- Oh, so that's, that's why you're bringing this to us because you can't do it a week before? Yes. <laughs> So let me, I'm gonna ask, Ms. Attorney, thank you for that. Uh, Attorney Delaney, um, cause um, rezoning, it is, in, it is in statute. It's in statute. So I wanna make sure that we don't like have this all, the table flipped over because there's another county who's had it flipped over. So help me with that, help us please. I would need to review that and get back to you. I don't have the, the whole mm -hmm. timeline and given the importance of this, I'm not gonna shoot from the hip. Um, I feel pretty confident that there could be an adjustment within that week. I don't know if that gives the board enough time if we had the workshop on the 17th or the 18th even. I, I feel comfortable that that wouldn't create an issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. The first reading is September 19th, so you can have, I just have to notice the workshop 14 days in advance before you, did. Because I just noticed it for the second, for the 16th meeting. So if you can move the workshop anytime before the 19th, because that's first reading. So thank you. Thank you for that. What I, what I had in mind, what I was thinking, um, I, I, in my mind, read, like there's some other things, like we're supposed to go, I think, to the SPAC. This is supposed to go before the SPAC. We haven't, that's not in our schedule. Um, I think, yeah, you know, I mean, some other, it's some other metrics, some other things that we got to like, some other thing, boxes we got to check outside of the, the rulemaking that you've advertised. That's what I had in mind. So I want to make sure that we, we do it. So if, if, if we have to reschedule the workshop to have a few more days to review it and the attorney, he's going to, you can get back with us to confirm that. And if everyone here, or if you all want to, we leave the workshop as scheduled on the 16th and we, the staff has, have us the information by the 14th that leaves you two days to review. Is that how you all want to proceed? Is that the will of? That's how I want to. You want to just leave it as it is? Because we do have those dates already on our calendar uh, to go forward and to try to like find something else. Um, um, I, but yeah, th I'm, I'm fine with, so long as we get that 48 hours and not like the evening before kind of thing. But, but Ms. Moore, her top priority right now should be rezoning. So isn't there anyone else that can do the daily uh, questions from parents and the rezoning? Uh, I mean, I feel like she, she, if she's just a one-man show and she's the only person that can do that, we have issues. And so we need, is, isn't there somebody else that could handle the daily stuff and she could focus just on the rezoning? She's doing it along with the staff. There are five staff members in the zoning office, and so they're doing that together. Um, and they still are having a difficult time making sure that they're meeting all of the needs of all of those families prior to school starting. At this point in the year, just the number, the volume of parents that contact the zoning office, it is, it is ridiculously high. So were, are any zoning exemptions being revoked this year to uh, manage numbers? Yes, ma'am. Like in Newberry and out in that area? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we had one, one appeals meeting already. We have another one that is scheduled for Thursday, but we also have been looking at um, the zoning um, as it relates to um, the schools that are overcrowded as we move forward and making decisions. Okay, and those, those zoning exemptions that were revoked, how much notice were parents given uh, that they were not gonna be able to attend those schools next year? Or is that a parental responsibility to go somewhere and check and see if it's changed? So they make application for zoning exemption and they get a response. And so all of the parents have received the response already if they've done that application. We are now in the appeal process. That is for parents who were not satisfied with the initial re, um, answer. Um, and we've done one meeting, we're moving to the second. And then there are also those who are coming for the first time. 
Okay, so I think, Dr. McNeely, did you have any input on that? Are you good with us leaving the, leave it like it is? Okay. Okay. So the 16th, we'll maintain the meeting and get the information to you the 14th of August. Okay. Yeah, um, I think the with this process was kind of, I ain't going to say, um, it was, there was a challenge on the end of our, with our consultant, DRMP, um, the person who has worked with the uh, Ms. Moore and the rezoning left their company. So with, he left and um, the person who was assigned to it, I think she had to get up to speed on it, like she didn't have it. So I'm like really shocked that the company, that the lack of knowledge transfer in organizations these days. I know I- Well, uh, Ms. That's what I'm saying. I'd, like, I'd like to speak to that, to, to be, um, Transparent. Uh -huh. um, Miss Martin, who is still working for DRMP, is is pretty is very knowledgeable, and she's she's the person that was assisting uh, Mr. Gilreath with the data support, and she's very knowledgeable and capable. He had to be on leave. She the timing the the issue was the timing of the departure of Mr. Gilreath uh -huh. coinciding with Miss. Uh, Martin a maternity having, leave. having her baby, yes. So it was kind of the great storm of, of things, but I want to assure you that Ms. Martin is, is very capable and very knowledgeable. She is the person who returns on Monday. And yes. We, and, and, and to the, po the point that I made earlier, we're not diminishing the other staff members. Martha's had a good relationship working with them, but um, I think that some of the questions that have come up, you know, even they've had to ask questions here and there and being able to have that team work together with her um, would expedite things and provide more clarity. And so um, we have had an opportunity to have some phone calls with her, but due to her maternity leave, there were certain in the insurance that she had, there were certain requirements where she could do no work whatsoever. Like we, she couldn't email message us or what have you. And so... <laughs> But she was on temporary disability, so no, no, I mean, no. it was. No, it was listen, listen. I understand um, childbearing and that separation between work. I am. I completely, completely, completely understand. My my my, so my was, comment was, was that, that with the change in staff. Yeah, it was the great storm of of timelines. Um, so, the other thing I wanted to mention is I think you mentioned the SPAC. The formation of this back needs to happen if we're closing a school or locating a school like we did with our new elementary school. It, I don't believe it's in our interlocal agreement that we form the SPAC when we're doing rezonings. So we don't have to go through the SPAC process for that. So it's more if we're closing a school, Got that. opening Open a school, Got re, that. Uh, reloc you know, we went through that process to locate the new elementary right. school, we had the SPAC formed for that. So the SPAC is formed and dissolved as needed. It's not a standing committee. So the SPAC it's is- It's something I read that we've got to be, and, I, and maybe I'm mistaken, so- I will, I will go back and double check, but I don't think that's one of the reasons we formed the SPAC, which is also known as the School Planning Advisory Committee. So, and the last time we had that was when we went through the whole process of locating the new elementary school. But I will double check that and, and send out an email to confirm. Okay. Okay. And speaking of this PAC, I know I remember the members and they've been on there serving for a while. Would we as board members put somebody on there? Is that something that's standard with the SPAC? I know with the SPAC, well, I'm glad you clarified that, but the people serving are the same people who've been serving for all these years? The SPAC is a committee, as I mentioned, that's formed and yeah. dissolved as needed. Okay. Um, and that's outlined in our interlocal agreement. Mm -hmm. And so the last time we formed the SPAC was for the locating of the new elementary school that was uh, constructed. Each of the cities and the county sent representatives and they each went through their own processes for determining who their representatives were, so they sent two. Mm -hmm. Typically it was a staff member and uh, a community member. Then we had a couple ACCPTA representatives, mm -hmm. and so those were the folks that made up our SPAC. We did not, as staff members, sit on the SPAC. We provided uh, technical support to them as they worked through their process. So that, that was basically 
the process. They nominated who their chair was and their vice chair, and, and we provided the technical support. We did have board members attend the meetings, um, but board members do not assign uh, committee members, and they're not on, on the SPAC committee. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Malone. Okay. All right, so um, do you have anything else, Ms. Um, Dr. Edwards? Not pertaining to rezoning. So, I mean, you have space here. This is our first update from you or, or since, since May, so I'm not trying to rush it along. I just want, we've had some discussion. I just wanted to make sure you had gotten out everything you needed so, before we moved on. No, I think it, um, the, I, maybe perhaps the one thing that I would say is that we've um, worked together in terms of our, our teams to look at um, the satellite stops as it relates to um, magnet riders as we um, are considering zoning and working with that with transportation um, to prioritize students who are zoned at schools. And um, again, I have already mentioned um, looking at where our magnets were. So we've been pulling the history of number of the students who have been accepted into magnet programs um, across time uh, to look at whether there are any caps that would be needed at any particular schools or changes or what have you to address the magnet concerns. So we're not shifting kids if we could also instead shift process. I did have one question too about the magnets process for this year. Are we like at Buholtz? Do we have students that are out of county admitted to Buholtz? Because that, that is not that's against board policy for a school that's over capacity for us to have someone from out of county in a magnet program. And I think and on principle that shouldn't be because taxpayers pay a, the mill mm -hmm. for and that spot should be for a county student if. Not someone students who've been enrolled in the magnet program have been in county students. I think where we have seen people from out of county is students who have gone to the school not to be in the magnet program, but are out of county going to Buholtz High School. Um, and it may have been as time went along that um, when students have left from the magnet program that those students who are then enrolled have then taken the seat that has become vacated. Out of county people in an overcrowded school. And, and it's not employee, because you know, there's a policy for employees, like if you work there and you live out of county, your kids get the exemption. But an out of county student shouldn't be in an over enrolled school. That's, definitely that's what policy is. not in say. a magnet program if there are Alachua County students on a wait list. Understood. There's lots of things that we're looking at in terms of historical and trying to make sure that, again, our processes are clean. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like, like now. I ain't talking about history. I'm talking about what's happening like right now. For the 23-24 school year? 22, 23, 23, 24, yeah. For 23, 24. I don't think we have, no. I, I have to go back and look, and um, I'll make sure that that's provided, um, but I don't think that we do at this time. If, if a seat has been offered to an out-of-county student to a magnet program, that is not in line with what board policy states. And I have one other question. In the forms, when people are applying for these exemption and things, mm -hmm. are all the forms that we have online that a parent can download, are those the most accurate, up-to-date forms? Because parents are saying they're printing, I don't know, relates to guardianship or what have you. They printed some form and then they bring it in. They say, well, they told me that form was not accurate. I just want to make sure. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, um, I had not I heard that. But it. we'll check to make. But sure just to make sure all of our forms on the website are up to different. date. So when people are applying for these exemptions, they're not submitting something because that just causes problems. Yes, ma'am. I hadn't heard that before, so I will definitely check and make sure we don't have anything old on the website. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. McNeil. Dr. Edwards. I think I heard today that you are in charge of the people who in attendance and zoning, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So I'm directing this to you. Since you know historically, every year at this time, parents can't get through to um, the office, board members can't get through to the office, 
And so I would hope that there might be one. I was told that zoning had a volunteer mm -hmm. at this time last year. There is no volunteer. Right. And so it concerns me when I make five calls through Connie, through Mrs. Pitt, and I can't get through. Yes, ma'am. What can you do about that? Well, I sent out um, an email to talk with our volunteer office to see if we can have volunteers. I had not been informed that we didn't have a volunteer yet. What has happened in the past is that people have come from different offices within the district and volunteered time to help take calls, write notices, and help just really um, support people who are in the line waiting, providing water, giving them numbers, so on and so forth. But it had not been communicated that a volunteer hadn't been established. I hadn't done that in the past. It has come by way of the office, and people have um, volunteered to share in that office. So I talked to Martha about that, and we'll make sure that she has volunteer support this year as well. You mean tomorrow and the next day because <laughs> well, the 10th is I, I next can't. week. But I'm just looking at my calendar, and I know how long it took me to get through. I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that our parents, I said that to Dr. Roel, I mm -hmm. think I'm saying his name correctly at my meeting today, Raul. Uh, transportation, same, same, what's his first name? What's his Don, first name? Don. Huh? Don Terrius. I'm not going to try the role. Don Terrius and I had a meeting and I said, do not have parents calling us a million times next week when school begins and you have no one to answer the phone. Yes, ma'am. That is a problem. I don't know who's in charge. That's, that's you, Miss Eunice. I thought about it. But, um, and he uh, assured me the new system they have, they, there won't be any of that. But zoning doesn't have a new system. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so, therefore, it's a problem. And for problem. our parents not to get through, do you know how many emails we get? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I Just get them as well. I pulled Somebody the call logs they get them to, for the they get them call to? queue, and they're only averaging about 100 calls a day on top end. Only averaging only 100 calls? That's still a lot, though. 100 on top of everything that they're already trying to do is still a lot. And 800 is, like, insane. That's, like... That's like GRU customer service. It's like, mm -mm. they can't pay me. That's a lot. Both of the people who, and, and they get so many calls in that short period of time. So, yeah, that's a lot. Thank you for that, Mr. Um, Foot. <laughs> you said eight, 100 a day for transportation, 800. 100 for zoning, 800. Wait, 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 wait. I had a flip flop. Say it again, Mr. Mullen. 100 for it. So many calls. Um, I, I pulled the report. 24th, they had 150. On the 25th, they had 120. On the 25th, they had 120. And then you said transportation was in the 800. And if you take a call for zoning, and I'm sure the same would be true for transportation, those calls are not 30 seconds. No, they're long. They're long calls, yeah. yeah. Oh boy. So do we do we volunteer? You are certainly Dr. McNeely, I'm not I'm not volunteering. I'm I, I would be willing to help my I'll file. I will file. <laughs> I'll file, but I will not do any phone duty. I'm tell y'all straight up, no ma'am. Mm -mm. Take the I, I trash would be out. I'm willing to do that for Martha, for Summer, for Don. I, I don't know all of the rest of the ladies, but they are inundated. And when you can't have lunch, I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. They don't take lunch. Huh? So I, I've been traumatized. I'm getting like flashbacks. When, I don't mind. The year they had all the storms. I had to go up and work in customer service. Mm -mm. I told them I'm, I'm not doing that. I go get the food, anything else. I'm not getting on nobody's phone. That's right. I'm not. I'm not taking no phone calls now. They need some filing help. I go give them an hour, some filing, a text print. So maybe we do look into doing like GR used to do with the temp, the temps to bring in some temp force help to help with things that 
to free up the staff to do the things that specialize or to just answer the phone and take the calls and to sort them out. This, call, this person is handling this and this person, we gotta do something to do that so we can provide a level of, of customer service during this time, but it is, it peaks during the summer months and it's getting crazy now with the appeals process. That's when it gets like insane, like insanely and people wanna know, so. I don't know what, what we can do to, to, ch to work through that, but maybe you got to get some, have a, some innovative solution of bringing in, bringing in some, Dr. Rockwell? Um, this might be an HR question, but do we offer, so when I worked at Santa Fe College, I often worked 10 or even 12 hour days during registration and drop ad because you get the same thing, 800 calls a day, but we, we had flex time. So if I worked a week of 10 or 12 hour days, I would build up an extra day or two of, of leave time that I could take. Do we have anything like that for the people in transportation and zoning so that when things calm down, they can? Very, very flexible with flex time because of documents and things like that. So they would Accounting, have state rules, yeah. which has been done historically. They will make decisions as they have to fill out the form, it has to be documented, and then it'll be sent for approval as to whether they can get additional time or they can have time off for the time that they've spent in. So we do try to make sure that we accommodate staff with additional hours they're working. Correct, and just to add, we have approved over time, like in transportation, this time of year and moving forward, and we do have some solutions. Mrs. Eunice is gonna share some of what they're working on for response, you know, being responsive to all the calls and everything coming in. So we are also looking at that operationally and she'll share some of that as we share updates here in a little bit. So I'm gonna take a 10 minute recess and we'll come back, it's 254, 304, 305, somewhere in there. Yeah, 305, let's come back at 305, okay?
your planning update. I almost said good morning, but good afternoon, Chair Certain, board members, Superintendent Andrew. I want to give you an update on our strategic planning thus far. Um, strategic planning started um, with envisioning at the end of June. We have four phases of strategic planning that we'll be going through. We'll have envisioning, planning, implementing, and evaluating. The goal is the superintendent would like for us to be able to start with implementing in January. So we have a couple a phase to go through before we get to implementing. Our next phase will be planning and that will be at the end of August. But during envisioning, we had about 40 plus district administrators, principals, board members there at Mabane and we engaged in looking at current reality, looked at data, we analyzed data, and we also looked at some future trends to determine and some themes as, as it relates to our strategic priorities. And so what we'll do is we'll use that data when we get back to planning to really look at some themes and come up with some strategic initiatives. The superintendent, myself, Dr. Atria, had the opportunity to meet with Cognia today. This was one of our planning sessions. These are built into our plan. Um, we talked a little bit about what that planning will look like for our next meeting. Um, before we get to planning, which will be August 31st and September 1st, we will have stakeholder interviews, which will occur August 30th. During those stakeholder interviews, we'll have students, teachers, parents, and community stakeholders um, interviewing with Cognia, who is leading this process for us. Those interviews will be in about 45-minute sessions. We will allow for virtual and face-to-face -face meetings to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to participate and to ensure equity and participation. Tomorrow, um, we will have some um, opportunities to meet as a team as well to look at some of those other pieces of um, data that came from envisioning. Um, district team members will look at those pieces and decide if we need to come to planning with additional data points to support with identifying those strategic initiatives. But that's where we are now with um, our strategic planning. Thank you, Ms. Roll. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll get my co let my colleagues go first. I'll start to my right, Ms. Abbott. Um, I just I thought the days were the 30th and 31st. When did it change? Yes, ma'am. Um, Due to feedback, um, our Cognia consultant switched the days. Um, the board chair had expressed that um, it would have been good to have stakeholder interviews and focus groups prior to planning. So we had already um, designated those three days for our um, strategic planning. We were going to do the stakeholder interviews on the Friday. So the representative came to me to ask if we can push that up, switch the days around. So um, to try as best as she could to accommodate um, the board chair's um, request to have data prior to the planning session. So it did require for me to go ahead and switch those days. So the date, I was surprised too with the date change. And um, yeah, June, June, and June, I did say to her, because I had, and I'll just tell my colleagues because I didn't talk to you all there, I spoke with Nicole, right? Yes, ma'am, Dr. Dr. Nicole Reeves. Dr. Nicole Reeves, Dr. Reeves. I'm concerned that we had only district staff in that, that first two days. We didn't have any com community partners there. We had no parents, no students. And I said to Nicole, to, to Dr. Reeves, that my concern was that we were trying to land on four key pillars without, with just the people in the room from this organization. And then we were gonna take those key pillars, how I understood it, and we were gonna have asked the community to buy into that. That's not how you do strategic planning. We had not heard from parents and students, and I felt the board needed to, um, that they need to be part of this process. And what I did not want to do as a board member, and this was just my feedback to her, as a citizen, I felt that the organization had done types of initiatives and outreach, community engagement in itself, and then they went to the community with a platform that they wanted the community to, to adopt. 
And that didn't, I didn't like that as a citizen, and I felt that that was that the flavor of the process. That's how it was starting out. That was just my view, but I didn't ask her to change any dates. And I, the, the dates, I was like you, I had them on Wednesday, Thursday, and so when I got the email a few days ago that this was moving to another date, it, that date doesn't work for me. That Friday doesn't work for me because I made plans um, already. So, um, but but I, I still, I'm glad she's doing some, some contact with, with community partners and I had a question about who our partners are, but I'll ask that before, if you have anything else. I just wanted to say that because I didn't ask for a date change um, or anything. You got anything, Dr. McNeely? No, no, I, I, I get it. Yes, yes okay. Um, Dr. Rockwell? Um, I, I plan to be there. I don't have an issue with the date change, but I wanted to say that I had also brought to Dr. Reeves my concern with um, the, so it wasn't just you, because I also brought my concerns to her. Um, even before we met, it was when the list of who was on the strategic planning team was released, and I said, there's no teachers, there's no PTA, there's no union, there's no students, there's no community, there's no parents, like, we're missing a whole perspective here. Um, and, and she explained to me that, that they would get those focus groups separately. And I said, well, if we're going to be doing a, themenic, a thematic analysis from qualitative methodology to determine our strategic priorities based on all this feedback, we can't start doing that thematic analysis until we have information from those people. Um, so I just wanted to say that it was not just the board chair, I, and I don't know that it was just the two of us either. Um, it could have been a consensus of board members, and that's why she um, worked with you to move the dates. Um, I, it does concern me that we are moving into planning so quickly after doing one day of, of focus groups. I, I'm concerned about how those other stakeholders are being chosen, how many of them will be chosen, will we be able to get enough data in one day of meetings with so many different stakeholders? I mean, just off the top of my head, I listed students, teachers, staff, families, community partners. I mean, this seems like the kind of thing that we should be doing weeks, if not months of meetings all over the district, um, at places of worship, at places, large pla employers, like maybe we could work with UF to get a meeting there with some of their people at, you know, there, it, it just feels like, and I know that some of this is Cognia's plan that you're implementing, so I'm not, but but I feel like we, this this kind of feels to me with the information I have like, checking a box, okay, we did these focus group meetings with some stakeholders, but I'm very concerned again with how they're chosen, how many of them, do we have a large enough sample, a representative sample, an equitable sample, and do we have time to truly thematically analyze these things? Um, and I know um, from talking to colleagues that, um, Chat GPT is helpful for thematic analysis, so maybe we can do it more quickly than we used to in the past, but I, I still wouldn't trust it to do it on its own. I would have humans checking that um, because AI is only as good as the programmers who, who tell it what to do, right? Um, but I, I'm just, I'm, I would rather push those dates back even more I know we've been a long time without a strategic plan, but we're, we're investing a lot of money, time, and energy as a board and as district staff into this plan, and we need to make sure that we do it right. Um, just to respond just a little bit, um, 
the individuals that were chosen, so for instance, the students, um, I met with Dr. Atria, we decided upon, um, we wanted to make sure that the students were representative of our demographics of, for our student population. So we looked at, you know, how many students we wanted to look at from each um, demographics. I was able to reach out to schools, um, sent that information to them, and they sent me students that they, that was representative of the demographics in which we spoke about. So I got those um, names from those students. The, um, the stakeholders, and I think that that was going to be what um, chair certain state community stakeholders. Um, we have stakeholders from um, Gainesville Forum All, University of Florida, Santa Fe College, Early Learning Coalition. Um, I've contacted, haven't heard back yet, faith-based leader will be our um, Dr. Um, Pastor Gerard Duncan, um, Leadership Gainesville, Chamber of Commerce, Children's Trust. Those are just um, the uh, community stakeholders that have been contacted to be a part of the community focus groups. In addition to Pastor Duncan, can you get, I don't know who else, but someone else that lives in the county? He doesn't sure. live in our county anymore. Sure. And so I don't know who, if that's an inclusive list, but I think there, he does, I know he doesn't live in the county. Yes, ma'am. Have you, and is anyone from the chamber, the chamber, the business community, are you having any, any of them on the list? I didn't hear. I yes, I do. Well. I have um, Ian Fletcher on the list from the Chamber of Commerce. And I would say um, when you're looking at um, other pastors, I may, I may have some other names to give that you can mm -hmm. consider. I don't uh, want to say names out unless they're interested in doing it that I think will be good. Sometimes we continue to bring the same people uh, to the table all the time, so we miss out on opportunities. So I'll give you some of my names you probably could, could consider as well. Thank you, and I guess at that point, then we'd have to go back um, um, to the superintendent to consider your request to change the date and time for those those uh, stakeholder focus groups. We'll discuss with Cognia. We'll talk with Dr. Reeves and Diana Weinbaum and look at our calendars and schedules. And then we can also discuss with them the scope of work if needed. Thank you. Um, was that all you had on this roll for us? Yes, ma'am. That's it for the strategic planning updates. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Superintendent Andrew, Dr. H, you have anything with that? Are you good with? Okay. All right. The only thing I would like to add is that Ms. Roll and I did spend a good deal of time making sure that we were representing all students from all subgroups, all demographics, as well as students and caregivers from all schools mm -hmm. so that we had equal representation of each division level, whether it was a rural school, a city school, or you know, some, somewhere in between uh, type of school. I think it's also important to point out that when we asked for identification of students, it's not necessarily that student's parent who would then be in the, in the parent group because that gives us a little bit, bit of a bias that we're trying to avoid. So we may have students whose parents aren't in the, in the focus group and parents whose students may not be in the focus group. And those groups will be in person? They're, um the, they will be them in person, um, group setting, questionnaires, or a combination. So it's, it, with a focus group, it's it's a com it's conversational, and there are a set of standard questions that are asked. So when we talk about the student focus groups, and and again, we're talking, we're doing elementary, middle, and high all separately. We're not joining those students together. It will be very similar questions to make sure that the data that we're collecting can align. That the questions we're asking are all you know will get similar responses and be able to see those patterns and generalities between them. Um, in terms of, well, go back to your question again, Chair Certain. 
I ask for the the oh in person yes person thank you surveys um, it won't we we have surveys that will uh, distribute but then the focus group will be different from the surveys in terms of the focus groups themselves as Ms. Roll indicated we're offering two options to make sure that we're being uh, providing equitable access for participation. So uh, students will likely participate virtually because they can participate from their school site. Their caregiver or themselves, if they're teenagers in high school, will not have to drive someplace particular. So they'll be able to participate from their school site. Uh, and we'll do the same thing for caregivers that they'll be able to pro um, attend virtually. We will also give them the opportunity to choose sort of a hybrid option. So if you're unable to come, we'll bring you in on Zoom. And those who can be with us face to face in the same room will all be together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is nothing else on that. Um, we, you, you have any calls? You got to let me know, okay? I can't. I'm sitting down lower, so I don't see you. All right. We'll move on to our next item: the uh, opening update for 23-24. So, Mrs. Eunice, why don't we start with operations, and we're going to move into some of. Uh, what we've been doing this summer to prepare for the start of this school year and some changes that we've already made as well uh, across our departments. And so, Mrs. Eunice, if you'll share with us what's happening in all the different areas that you're covering. Sure. Thank you, um, Superintendent Andrew, Board Chair Certain, and Board members. I appreciate this opportunity to be able to give a brief update on operations. So I'll start with human resources. HR continues to partner with ESS, Employee Service, Self-Service, as they transition as the new vendor for substitutes. ESS hired two full-time employees who have offices at the district office. Under the ESS program, the district increased the pay for classroom substitutes for the 23-24 school year, classroom teacher subs with high school diplomas, associate degrees, and bachelor's degrees will earn $15 an hour. Retired teachers who substitute will earn $17 an hour. Anyone interested in being a substitute for classroom teachers, paraprofessionals, custodians, and food service can apply online at ESS.com or call 352-955-7730, extension 1045. Um, District-wide, still in HR update, um, as of Monday, July 31st, we have hired 227 instructional employees and 241 non-instructional employees. Uh, food and Nutrition Services update, as you know, Jamie Lovett is, has been appointed as the new Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Uh, yesterday, August 1st, Food and Nutrition hosted their back-to-school management meeting. It went very well. It was at the Austin Carey facility. Um, since 2015, Food and Nutrition Services has not had to increase meal prices. Um, this year, due to increased food and labor costs, meal prices have to have been increased. So the new paid meal prices are $1.50 for breakfast, $2.50 for elementary lunch, $2.75 for secondary lunch, $2 for adult breakfast, $4 for an adult lunch, and this is still the best deal in town. Uh, this year, Food Nutrition Services has 32 CEP community eligibility provision sites. Those are the all free sites, 32, and 20 are non-CEP that did not qualify for this program. Food Nutrition Services will be serving um, several new sites starting this school year on August 10th. Constellations Charter will be serving breakfast, lunch, and snack. Santa Fe Academy Charter will serve breakfast and lunch. Gainesville for, for All, the Gainesville Empowerment Zone Family Learning Center will serve breakfast, lunch, and snack as a contracted program. And Food and Nutrition Services will begin serving supper program to the Willie Mae Stokes Community Center site in Micanopy. And we're proud to say that the new Food and Nutrition Services Warehouse is now fully stocked and up and running at the Civia location. 
at maintenance. Um, They're working diligently to get everything ready for the first day of school. Maintenance is continuing to proce process on all school hardening and Sally Port concepts throughout the district. In planning and construction, Ms. Wen gave this update earlier, but continues to work on Westwood Middle School new construction project. The um, design has begun, design phase has begun for the Littlewood Elementary project. The construction manager has been advertised starting yesterday, August 1st. And we're wrapping up the summer projects that we have completed during the unoccupied times in planning and constructions. And last but certain, can I um, stop you? Just I had one, two questions, but I'll, this one I wanna ask when you mentioned about the security thing. Um, the contracts for the school resource officers, does that run school year or is that fiscal year for them? October 1 to September 30th, the renewal of that. For school resource officers? Yes. I'll have to get back to you on that. So what, what is their contract year? When's the renewal coming to the board? I hadn't seen it. And I'm trying to figure out if it is school year, um, June 30th, or if it is the fiscal year, because the city and the county are on an October 1, September 30th fiscal year. And I'm not sure if, the, if, the, if that, that school resource officer contract runs on their fiscal year or ours, the school districts. That's why I'm asking. I, have, I didn't look it up, but I, when you- I have to get back to you on that. I don't know the answer. Thank you. And can I ask, since I've already stopped you, you said that there are 32 CEP sites and 20 non-CEP sites, and then you said we're providing to the new constellation and to the Santa Fe Academy. Does that include the Santa Fe dual enrollment students also, or just the charter, 75 students in their charter? We are continuing to feed the dual enrollment students. They, um, they're actually, we, um, it's fed through the, um, a restaurant on campus at right. Santa Fe. We just basically do the claim for Santa Fe College. Oh, I, okay, so I got another question, but, but we, go ahead. We do, um, we do uh, oversee it. We review that program, make sure they're in compliance because we, would, we are the sponsor and we just basically pass the claim through. For oh, I was trying to figure out what they're doing because they say that's part of the, why they charge us more than the per credit hour fee. That's all, I'm just, I'm just trying to, <laughs> I was shocked to hear that, so. Okay. We Thank just you. passed the claim through you, you, for Santa Fe College, yeah. You passed, so they, they give us the information and you, you pass the claim, the claim through? They feed the students and we file the claim for them. So we're doing some work too. I don't see how, okay, all right, go ahead. So, so, so basically Santa Fe is giving each of our dual enrollment students a voucher to go to their dining hall, which has, it had like a Subway, Subway and a yeah. Pizza Hut and whatever. It's La Fortuna and um, that's the, and then it's been in the past but. and then they get reimbursed through the federal meals program is that what we're filing we filed a claim for santa fe college but i'm assuming that what that meal program covers is less than what they're spending to feed our students is that it's actually more expensive and they they have to pay the difference at santa fe college okay so santa fe is paying the difference it, okay. it, it doesn't it doesn't add up but okay <laughs> I'm just trying to figure it out. You're trying to help me out, huh? <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Jonas. I didn't have any other things. So last but not least, transportation. Dr. Rawls has been appointed as the new director of transportation. Transportation held their amazing all staff back to school meeting on Monday, July 31st. It was at the new IFAS building in Newberry. It was a very wonderful event. Um, I think all of those, all of the transportation staff really appreciated that, that meeting. Um, so we have launched a new communication system online to um, respond to all community inquiries. Um, so community members can visit the transportation website and click on we want to hear from you and complete the contact request form and someone from transportation will respond within 24 hours during the work week. Um, during the break we were actually working on getting a banner um, put onto the a, a CPS website um, to have it so it's on the landing page for the school board and so we're going to have that there as well as as on the transportation website 
and all of that information feeds into a spreadsheet and the transportation team is answering that. We've been doing that all week and we answer within 24 hours. We um, either email or contact the family based on the phone number that they input into that form. And all of our phone calls coming into transportation are feeding into that form as well. Um, Ms. Loomis, can I ask a question about that? Sure. So they have to go to the website to, we want to hear from you. What if they call and they don't have? Um... If they call in, we have someone answering the phone in transportation and she fills out that form for them to log all calls so we can be tracking that. But that, that information is being um, sent to the route coordinators and they're responding to the questions from the, from the community. They have 800 calls you just took. So I, I've had experience where I couldn't get through. <laughs> I'm just week? trying to figure out like. Recently? I haven't tried it recently, so that's good. It's just been a We're week. We're working on that. So, so I'm just trying to figure out. So there's the alternative. If they go to the website, and now they can call in, and we're thinking they're going to get through, and their information will be taken, and then they'll get a call back. So we kind of got like a, a lack of a better word, like a receptionist to just fill calls. We have a number of different ways you could communicate, that the community can communicate. You can call in. You can go onto the website and respond on the form. We also are going to have two laptops at the entrance. It's my understanding that there are parents that come to the actual transportation facility and get uh, have questions. We're going to have two laptops at the entrance so that they can fill out that communication and we can get response to them within 24 hours. That's good. Cause Dr. McNeil just drove over there because she couldn't get through on the phone <laughs> before. <laughs> She's driven over because she couldn't get through on the phone. So I'm just trying to figure out if we have folks, because this is serious, because everyone doesn't have a computer, right? right. Everybody does have a phone, so if they can get through on the website. But for some, we may have someone who doesn't have that capability, and I'm just trying to make sure we can serve them. But that's and, and we have several people answering phones. It rolls over to dispatch as well, the phones, when the main number is not working. So okay. I'd like to be made aware if you have troubles going forward, getting um, getting into an answer. Um, we also are going to do, um, I was just working with Jackie Johnson on um, sending out sky alerts um, to make sure that families know this information, that they know to go to the website and fill out that form and that they will get an answer within 24 hours a day, uh, within 24 hours. And um, so the really good news also is that tomorrow, August 3rd, Find My Bus will go live. Um, we successfully tested it today, and we are ready to roll. Find My Bus, that's the app that kind of gives the location of where the buses are? Is yes, that what that is? Yes, it connects to um, Versatrans, mm -hmm. and um, we've been working with Mrs. Neal uh, um, and made sure that the Skyward information is going in and it's good information and we, we did a test today and so how, far how so many good. were in the sample of that test? We just, uh, how many were in the sample? Of the test, yeah. We just logged in and made sure that the, that the information is coming up in the Find My Bus. Was it one bus you were trying to find? Like, so did say like a couple, how many users were trying to find the bus is what I'm asking. How many buses were out and how many users? So were like, say if you were gonna test it, and you, did you have like three parents? We were just testing the system today. So it goes live tomorrow. And so if we'll, we'll know tomorrow with, I guess if a number of, but if that, if there are issues, we are, we are gonna push the community to fill in or call fill in our form so that we can answer those issues. Thank, thank you for that. Jackie's coming over. Um, so I guess what I was asking, like, I, so, about live tracking as the bus is traveling around. Yeah, like stress tests. Like, so it's good to like, like systems, it's been my experience, like, I'm just gonna speak from my limited experience with financial systems. So like, you may try it in like one draw entry, no problem. Um, let's, Five journal entries, no problem. You may run a test if the journal entry doesn't balance, if the account strings not work, like stress testing it. So I'm just wondering, like, if you, like, because one, one is usually not a problem in a small environment. Like, and school's not in yet. 
And so I'm just wondering, like, if you had, like, if you sent five or ten buses out and you had your staff just trying to test, that's all I'm asking. So Find My Bus is just families logging in, putting their, um, their, Oh, it's so find your okay route. inquiry. Okay, finding okay, the route. inquiry of like the to route. find the route number. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, that <clears throat> system is up and running and ready for families to log in and find their bus route. So I'm gonna tell you why. You know, there are like districts that have bus systems, like tracking type systems. That's what I was equating okay. it to. Right. So I was like, you, you went live yesterday. <laughs> so I can also speak to. We are doing. Uh, all of the bus drivers are paid to go out prior to school starting and make sure they understand their routes so if they're new they all of them are going out to do the a, a pre-run before school starts is that new is that something is that a new procedure or has that been done i believe that's been done in the past oh okay okay and mr that's certain good. you're talking about where's my bus and we haven't moved there yet but there is that app that where's my oh, bus that's what that's exactly, that's exactly what right. i thought she was saying yep, um, yep. yeah by my bus, not where is my bus, okay. Where's my okay. Bus? So my only other request is, um, or my only, throw this out there, concern, the western buses, the buses that like travel southwest 8th, Newberry Road, and twin, like coming in, going to Buholtz and 4 o'clock, or anything that's coming from the west and going east or going out into that, it's been, um, they sometimes have them scheduled real tight like the time and just the traffic and um, something happened. It's just like, I don't, I'm, I'm just telling you, it is, it's a nightmare. Uh, Are you speaking of AM or PM? Both. Oh, okay. <laughs> both. I'm serious, uh, Ms. Rudis, and all jokes aside, because when you, when you, there are certain places on Newberry Road, you can't, once you go, you can't get off, right? In Southwest 8th, you can come in, like when I'm trying to go to the schools, the DA schools, the, 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 to, for a visit. You can, it, on Southwest 8th, when you pass over Parker Road, before you get to Granite Park, the traffic can be backed up to Granite Park to just get through the Fort Clark Boulevard intersection. That is, if, so if a bus driver tells y'all that, they are not lying. And I'm not talking about a one-off, I'm talking about every single day. Okay, I'll work with that. So, I mean, just like when we're doing the routes and planning them, I, I, I've had, I had a discussion with um, another director. It, it is, it's challenging. And we don't want the drivers to be driving unsafe to make their times that they have on there. I know the GPS will say, oh, it can take X number of minutes to get a short period of time. But it takes me to travel 7.1 miles in drive time. It takes me 45 minutes to drive east 7.1 miles to get to the mall. It takes 45 minutes. And to go to from, from where I live to Idlewild is an hour, 15 minutes, easy. So that, that's my only concern. And I know we got the challenges that we have, but honestly, if the drivers tell you all that it is taking a lot of time in that, believe them. They, they're not just trying to get extra work time. They're not. It's... Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Dr. McMillan. Mrs. Um, Eunice, I don't know if you were the one or if it was the superintendent or the deputy who served to hire whatever his first name is, Rose. Dontavious. Uh, Dontavious. I um, met with him today, and I would encourage the other colleagues if they have received an invite for, from him, that they should take it. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a lot. He is definitely a youngster, but he is old in mind and knows his stuff. What I like about him, he has a CDL. Yes. And our former uh, directors did not. And so he says because he started out as a bus driver, he understands all of the things that employees may come in and say to him. Unfortunately, I had a lot to say to him today, and although we had a master board training on Monday about governance, but I still had things I needed to say to him pre previous to his arrival. It was somewhat unfair because he's only been here a week and a half. But I said, I'd like to meet again with you in a couple of months, maybe, maybe even weeks, to see how you have led your department. 
but he's so knowledgeable. I'm going to be the first to purchase his book in October. He said that would be released. And um, it was very interesting to know his um, expectations of his employees and what he wants to do. One of the things I want to share with you, I've already shared that with the superintendent, but the safety of the employees and where they work. Um, years ago, when Mrs. Clark was the superintendent, we had a tour, um, and there was supposed to be major changes. Unfortunately, those individuals are still working in unsafe conditions. I, I, I don't know how they manage in 95 degree weather where you cannot close and have air because the buses are too long. They can't even fit in the whatever you call what they, what, what is that called? Where they pull the bus in. Oh, no, it's not, they don't say garage. What's the, what's the, the bank? Oh, the bay. Thank you. They can thank you, Miss Tech. They cannot close because the buses are so long. Um, the buses on the other side of the garage, across, those are the warranty buses. So those guys don't have as much work to do because those are newer vehicles. On the garage side, where the bay is, where if you cannot close it down by your time you get off, you have to work, I guess, overtime in order to do the engine or do whatever they are doing on these buses. I'm very concerned that we've been very blessed not to have had any um, accidents for those employees because it's un to me, it would be unbearable with the heat that we are um, under. You have just a big fan. <laughs> I thought, I can't believe this. And um, we talked about that today. We talked about even reclassification. But after, no, 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 no. I'm just going to say I want to give her her kudos, Mrs. Keck, who met with an employee and explained why they have not had that. And when we start looking, because you're over custodians as well, I don't know who's over the, not who, you're not the chief of operations for them, who's over, the, who's over those people? Burkett. Oh, oh, Mr. Burkett, we'll talk later. <laughs> but, but Mrs. Peck did an excellent job on explaining that to the employee and um, why the denial had come through. And I think they left with an understanding that how it would impact everybody else in the district. So he's listened. Mrs. Peck was excellent with her, and, and you might want to use her with some other um, employees because she knows her stuff. She has that kind of knowledge. So thank you for hiring him. And I look for um, great things, like I'm looking with Dr. Edwards, Dr. Um, Atria, Mrs. Roll, um, Mrs. Hutchison, everyone. I just know it's going to be an extraordinary year. We've got some good people in place who will carry on this district and with this board, all five of us, we are going to make sure that we are following through and that these things are going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. McNeely, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to interrupt your comments, but, we, but the labor thing, yeah, because, okay, so I just don't, last, last night I was kind of informed. We kind of got in a, in a puddle, okay. and I was trying to keep us out of the puddle tonight, right. not two days in a row, okay? Yeah. Can I, can I just say I am in full support of a new facility for, for transportation. And um, I, I think we are in a great place with Dr. Rawls. I think we are very fortunate to have him. Like you said, he 
started as a bus driver. He was assistant director in Osceola, a large county, and then director in Flagler County. So we are very fortunate that he has, has accepted the position here in Alachua County. And I also want to say that I've had the opportunity to go over to transportation quite a bit. And I want to say there are some really hardworking, dedicated, wonderful staff in transportation. And I want to celebrate them because I think they really work hard and they're They've, they've stepped up for weekend work. We have had a couple different um, events on the weekends, and they came to help prepare for the, the um, back-to-school meeting. They're, they're very, very dedicated and appreciate them very much. I tell you this. He's a baker, and I bet you didn't know did that. I did not know that. Be because that's the kind of talk we have. Okay, he's a baker okay. and a dad of a nine-year-old. Thank you. Ms. Yunus, I do um, thank you for your update. I have two requests, and I, just if you would mark the dates down on the 5th. Um, it'll be an evening. Right? We need, I need a bus tour. I'll be, I'm, we're hosting the Florida School Board Association Board of Directors meeting here. And I want to get a bus from the hotel to the Cade so that all the, everybody could go there for dinner. And I'll need to talk with you about that. And then um, in November, which I don't have the date, I think it is November 29th, um, the East Side ROTC and their color guard and the choir, I think, will be coming down to Tampa. And they, they're, Mr. Hickman, said he has the CDL. His, I've talked with Mr. Williams about it, so we'll need a bus bus or van. I don't, if, I don't know how many students will be for that as well. So I need to figure out how that is, if that comes, if that could be paid out of our, our board account. I'm not sure. I have to check with the superintendent or whatever, or if the FSBA doesn't pay for it, so i got to figure out what a cost is and if it comes from us and if there's a cost or whatever, okay? So those are two days we'll need. Does anyone else have anything for Ms. Ms. Yunus? Or we, okay. well, thank you for your update, Ms. Yunus. Superintendent Andrew, I'm not sure if you who who goes next or how you're gonna go next. Thank you for sharing all those <laughs> updates, Mrs. Eunice. Um, next, we'll jump to Mr. Burkett with some updates out of finance. I know we had budget recently, but yes, sir. Thank you, Superintendent Andrew, <clears throat> Madam Chair, and board members, um, and Dr. Manili. I also when, when transportation was in business services, I had my I had my CDL license as well, uh, for the same reason. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, I'll be brief. Um, uh, our benefit department is, uh, of course, working hard with uh, all the new, uh, processing all the new employees that have been hired. They'll be gearing up for uh, uh, open enrollment starting in the fall. And uh, I need to get an update on the uh, concept of opening a clinic. Um, I know they're working on trying to determine what level of service that uh, they want the clinics to provide to our employees. So uh, that's in process and still in the planning stage. Um, payroll department, I think it's, we've got one of the best payroll departments ever. Um, it's amazing how they can, how that runs compared to when I was here before. It uh, uh, really has improved. Uh, purchasing, of course, continues. Always been a great department, hardworking and uh, uh, doing the best for the district on, on obtaining, uh, keeping costs down and uh, awarding bids. Um, of course, like everybody else, all departments are busy in, in this, uh, building during the, the summer. And uh, finance, of course, is, is very busy. We've got two young staff members, both directors, uh, both budget and finance director are uh, fairly new. Um, this is Ms. Freeze. She worked on the financial statements last year, but this is her first year uh, working on her own. And of course, uh, Ms. Ford, uh, this is her first year going through a complete budget cycle. So they've been quite busy and uh, working quite hard. Um, that's pretty much what I have, I think, at this point. We know we're still working on budget and uh, financial statements and have a, a ways to go at this point. 
Thank you, Mr. Burkett. There was a citizen last night who said he worked as a sub and they didn't withhold Social Security. Do you know anything about that? Uh, substitutes are, and Mr. Shaw, I'm not probably answer okay. better, but, but, but substitutes are considered OPS, and so there is no uh, Social Security. I don't know if we pay the Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Medicare. Oh. So we have that OPS thing like UF where they don't they don't participate in yeah. what? I had a very brief conversation with Mr. Venturini, who's a supervisor in payroll, and I think he was watching and he said he looked up and there was some FICA things and I, I don't want to get into a lot of specifics. I had a very brief conversation with him, but uh, I don't know how long ago that was or I, there may be some other factors. Oh, okay. So, um, but but currently, right now, ESS, we don't know how they do that because all the subs are paid through them, correct? That is correct. Yes, ma'am. The, the ESN and, and previously with the previous vendor, Kelly also. substitutes were not our employees. They are employed by those companies. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Next. Thank you, Mr. Burkett. We'll move on to Mrs. Roll. Oh. Good afternoon again. Um, just a few updates from teaching and learning. Teaching and learning is busy supporting schools with getting the school year started. I wanted to share a few of the, the um, strategies we have in place to support teaching and learning in our schools this year. Before I start with the strategies, I did want to say that, you know, I, I share the urgency, I share the passion that I hear from the board as I've had the opportunity to sit in, I think it's two or three board member meetings now. I share that passion. I, I know the urgency to ensure that we are increasing student achievement and increasing outcomes for students within our district who have historically not had better op outcomes. So in my leadership in teaching and learning, the goal is to ensure that we are working on the strategies to really look at those subgroups and those students who have not had an opportunity to be successful within our school system. So in saying that, I do want to say that some of the strategies will not be new strategies. Some of the strategies will be some of the same strategies that we've had. We will have new strategies as well. But I think that it's key to say that what we'll do with the new strategies is look for evidence of implementation, evidence of impact. That's important as I've done this work as a school improvement principal. I've led schools um, that were um, on our east side of Gainesville, our SI schools. Um, one thing that I know is that it's not necessarily about what we say, it's what we're doing. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to be looking for evidence of impact, evidence of implementation, and implementing that continuous improvement cycle, plan, do, check. Act. I've already had the opportunity to meet with my team, and I think that they're ready for the charge. They're ready to go in and support our schools with this work. I'm going to start with looking at our school improvement plan. That's important because that's what's going to drive the work in our schools this year. It has always been a part of the beginning of the school year. School leaders are responsible for creating the school improvement plan. That is their strategic plan for their school but we need to put a heightened focus on actually implementing and using it to guide the work. And that may be something that we're gonna, maybe a little mindset shift, um, but it is what we're going to be doing in our EDs and our, our TSAs. Everyone is going to be supporting schools because this is what this is really about. It's about supporting schools and school leaders with getting better outcomes for our students. So one of the things that we've started off with this year is we've partnered with BSI. BSI has provided technical assistance um, for all of our schools within our district. We started off with our um, SI schools, but we moved into with our elementary schools and also our middle and high schools. That technical assistance um, also entailed providing support with looking at the VAM visualization tool. That's important because with that tool, our school leaders should be able to go in and look at our teacher's strengths and be able to use it for scheduling to make sure that we have the right teachers in front of the right students. And so that's another area of support that um, our BSI team has provided for our schools. 
Um, we've also focused on making sure that we are um, having the areas of focus embedded within our SIP that address our subgroups. We talked a little bit during our principal uh, breakfast about um, the ATSI schools, our TSI schools within our district, and we wanna make sure that we are embedding those areas of focus to address those um, um, persistently um, underperforming subgroups. And our school, our, ED, our executive directors will be walking into schools holding data chats with our school leaders and using, and this is something that will be new this year, a common district walkthrough tool. And so we're looking to um, either use a tool that we've, um, we could have um, access to through Cognia and maybe shaping it to use um, it in the way that's gonna best benefit our district. But the use of the common district walkthrough tool will allow us to see trends across our district related to implementation of strategies, implementation of curriculum, and then to look at the overall supports that are being provided um, at the school level. So that's, that's where I'm gonna stop right now with the strategic, um, I should say the um, school improvement plan. Any questions about the school improvement plan before I go on to the next area? I don't have a question. I'll, I'll save it. Anyone else have a question? What? Well, I'm gonna. I have. I don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, what yeah. I have noticed, in even last year's, the some strategic those school improvement plans. Yes, ma'am. Still referenced um, the old tests and not fast, and they had growth. They had, you know, that they were gonna. They were looking at, um, like they had. Um, what was it? Oh, the word is escaping me now. Mm. Um, it wasn't, it was, because was, there was no growth. It was only achievement this past year. Correct, yes, ma'am. A couple plans referenced, like, growth. And, and I, and I, and so I guess, what, from, I don't want it just to be, like, a tool. I mean, we got to make sure that this is not the template, that they're just rolling forward every, um, from the previous year. So, um, I thought y'all yeah. were reviewing those, like you Yes, ma'am. Because... I know, I know that's one of the questions I asked, what they may have written, because this is a new year. <laughs> so we're looking at what they had, and they may have to go back and make an adjustment and make those changes. And, and I'm gonna agree with Ms. Certain. A school improvement plan is only as good as the people that are behind it. And I, I, school improvement plans are not up there with me because I think there's much more, many more valuable ways to get children to achieve than, than that. I don't think they're they're written every year, and I I wonder how often they're going back and looked at during the year, and so that concerns me. Well, I think um, Miss Abbott, you have a right to be concerned because you're right. Historically, they have not been valued in that way, but the school improvement plans allows us to be proactive as opposed to reactive. So I'm agreeing with what you're saying. You're right. Um, the school improvement plan has not historically been used in that way, but I will tell you that any part of school improvement involves using that school improvement plan. There's no work that I could have done as a turnaround principal or supportive turnaround schools without first leveraging that school improvement plan. There's, it's a thoughtful process. Um, we gathered data for our schools. We made sure they had all of the early warning systems that they needed to look at. Um, that included a attendance and behavior, because whereas we're talking about academics, we know that the attendance and behavior has a direct effect on the, beha um, on the uh, um, academics. So I agree w with what you're saying. Um, there, is, there are a lot of reactive um, strategies that happen in buildings that when school leaders don't put in a strategic plan, um, and the goal is to have our school leaders really look at data and to put a plan in place that's going to address the needs of their students. Um, you know, so I, I, I agree with what you're saying, but it still, it still needs to be addressed and it needs to be implemented in a way that is intended to be um, implemented. Mm -hmm. and, and to address what um, Board Member McGraw said, yes, the executive directors, those school improvement plans are due 
um, to the district August 21st. The executive directors review those school improvement plans prior to me becoming chief of teaching and learning. I reviewed the school improvement plans for the schools that I supported. I provided feedback. I looked at the strategies. I looked at the, the, the data. I may have had some questions, you know, as to if this was the correct strategy or did, how do you think we're going to, um, how do you think we're going to use this strategy in the building? But um, those school improvement plans, uh, when implemented correctly, really serve as a strategic plan for that school. Theoretically, okay, go ahead. Because um, if we, I? I, I don't disagree, and I know we have to do those plans. Yes, ma'am. But I, I, I agree they should be used. And what you just said—that's the theory. It's the practice. Evidence of implementation and evidence of impact. This is really what this is about. It's evidence of implementation and evidence of um, of impact. So this tool that you just mentioned, the standard BAM visualization tool. Um, yeah, no, the standard, the district, the, the district walkthrough tool. How right. how are we going to be looking for evidence of implementation and impact and tracking that and making adjustments if we don't see that? If you, if we don't see the the implementation of strategies within buildings, and impact. Right. So I, so that's the other thing that's key about the school improvement plan and the walkthroughs and supports from our EDs. Um, the expectation would be we'd walk into the building, we provide um, schools with walkthroughs um, and that data, but it's just as I've supported the school in, the um, schools on the east side of Gainesville, the same thing when you've seen that work also, um, Chair Certain, it's those conversations coming back to the school leaders and creating an additional action plan for improvement. And the goal is not to see it and to walk away and talk about it. The goal would be to create another action plan to ensure we're supporting students and then to go back and follow up on that. It's a continuous improvement process. We're going to be looking more week to week, you think, or every two weeks or? Well, currently, right now, we're looking at going in the, the EDs at least um, once a month. Um, we do have some schools in our district that we do week to week, and we do have some that will be biweekly. Okay. Um, but overall, mo most of our schools in our district will be just a monthly um, check-in and a walk. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that it's a comprehensive walk. It could be just walking to certain um, classrooms, grade levels, content, it, do, it doesn't mean that it's, it's comprehensive um, across the entire school. Dr. Atria, did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to expand a little bit on, you know, we often want to know what's different, right? So what's different regarding school improvement plans? You are absolutely correct. These have had to have been submitted for approval by both the school district and the state for decades. And what has initially, they were meant to truly drive improvement in schools. They quickly became compliance items. Let me fill this out, check the box, send it off, I'm done, I'm going back to work in my school. One of the biggest differences what we have done this year is we have brought every school principal from every school to a site either here at the district office or at various school sites where they have sat with members from the BSI team and members from Ms. Roll's office to work through and comprise and develop their school improvement plan. So it becomes data informed and data rich and evidence has to be based in the data that is collected throughout the year. That's one thing that's very different. Every principal from every school has been required to do this, and the plan needs to be reviewed and written in a very robust way. Another difference that Ms. Roll just referred to is throughout the year, Ms. Leinenbach, Ms. Hutchinson, um, Ms. Dell and Ms. Wakely will be working with the principals much more in a coaching fashion than they have in the past to making, looking at the school improvement plan. This is what you said you were going to do. Is it happening? What's the evidence that it's happening? If it's not happening, what support do you need to make it happen? If it's not happening because it can't happen, how do we need to re revise your school improvement plan so that we can make gains with what's happening for students? And all of that will then tie together as part of the principal's evaluation. 
So it's not just what's happening for students, but it is definitely tied into the work that the principal is doing. We know that the most important variable in the success of a student is the teacher in the classroom. The second most important variable is the quality of the leader in the school. And that's one way we can hold the leaders of the school accountable for what's happening in classrooms. I think that's a big difference that we're seeing this year regarding school improvement plans. So thank you for that. Um, that sounds robust and, and on an act. And so if I guess when, what, a, when a checkpoint, so if the board wanted to have a checkpoint uh, to look at the checkpoints that you all are doing because y'all are staff for us to see that, to see evidence of that. Tell me when it, when when would when could we have a checkpoint at that if myself or anyone else wanted to come so I could put it on my calendar to be able to see. Couldn't that be on the agenda? Be the ninth, uh, uh, on a board agenda? Uh, you're talking about like a regular yeah, a a regular, regular checkup so we can. Report? And I think that's good. I think we need to have a regular checkup on the process because right now. Uh, I think we're at a, a pessimistic state, and we got to get to a real optimistic state. And I thank you for how you explain that. What is actually going to be done step to step so that we can show the community, and I think it's important that we show what the superintendent and staff has made, because I'm very optimistic this year, I would tell you that, um, with the conversations that I had. But what we can do moving forward, I think every month, like she said about each month, come and give us a report. Here's the improvement that has been doing, because I know third grade is separated out, proficiency or whatever we decide to do. Here's how we're doing uh, academically. Here's how we're doing behavior. I think it all needs to be, because all of that relates to me, to the, you know, the curriculum and to academics. So I think each month we can have it on our calendar where you give an update on how we're doing with our data. What I, what I worry about, what I don't have an answer to, is what specific data we would have for you on a monthly basis. I wonder a little bit more about looking at the progress monitoring data throughout the school year and seeing how that aligns with what the school improvement plans for the individual schools have included. As it relates to the achievement gap, I mm -hmm. think it, that's extremely important because that is what everybody in the community has been talking about, everybody is concerned about, and so we can get an update on a regular basis on how we're doing. Whatever you think is best because that's, I, you right. are the experts in that, but I think that if we can show the community chart-wise, because some people are visual, some people hear, Here's how we're doing. Here's where we were last year. I, however you want to do it, but as long as we can get an update where the average citizen can understand. Well, I, I think that would be best to come in quarterly. It's um, So when we're talking about con continuous improvement and we're talking about putting strategies in place, you have to give time for those strategies to work, right? And yeah. so when we um, go into schools and we provide feedback and we put another strategy in place, we want to see and we want to give that opportunity for that strategy to, to see if that tra strategy is working. So that's evidence of impact. Well, I think that, right. yes, ma'am. Maybe even with strategies, if yes. that strategy you feel is working, Whatever it is, just just I think the continuously marketing yes. the improvements that all makes it come together to close that gap is going to be real important to be marketed to this community this yes, year. Sir. Yes. Um, and then before I move on from school improvement plan, I did want to go ahead and address just um, Ms. Abbott, the school improvement plan template has changed this year. And so that's not like a copy and paste. Um, this is a different template um, within our school improvement plan. So um, uh, school leaders are required to, to fill out different um, templates. I know that um, Ms. Hutchinson and Ms. Leinenbach have been in there with them, but this is not the same template that they've had um, in previous years. And, and I would feel much more hopeful about all of this because we have new leadership and I feel like it is going to be, there are going to be some really positive things that happen. And I know you've had experience with turning schools around at different levels. Yes, ma'am. But I'm going to go back. We don't have teachers in the classroom. And, you know, we, we sit here today and we spend an hour and a half talking about Diamond Sports Park. And, and the whole time that I've been here since November, we've never had an in-depth discussion about how we're going to get teachers in those SI schools, 24 vacancies in the SI schools. And if you look at the schools in the West, one, two, maybe. And so we're starting the year the same way we've started years for the past four or five years 
with vacancies in the classrooms. And Rawlings said, I go about it, it only has two vacancies, but Metcalf has them, Alachua has them, Terwilliger has them, all of our SI schools. And so to me, you've you got school improvement plans, you're gonna walk through, you're gonna walk through and observe subs in there, in, in some of these classrooms. There could be kids, again, and I'm gonna try not to get, because my stomach's in nut, knots right now. I'm gonna try not to get so emotional about it, but there could be kids who had a sub last year who has a sub again this year. And, and we've gotta do something differently, and we've gotta brainstorm, and we, school starts on, on August 10th. And so you can have all these wonderful plans, but if you don't have bodies in place that can do that, and, and again, there is a way we can get some bodies in the classrooms, but everybody, and, and, and goes against me when I say pull some of those TSAs. And I'm not saying that you have to pull every TSA, pull enough to get some more bodies in the classroom. That's what I'm gonna say. And then one other thing I'm gonna say with regards to last night when I was going about the 40 children and I wondered how many level ones were retained, I found out last night from a reliable source that about 20 of those kids were retained. And even though it breaks my heart that children were retained, I am happy. I am happy that those 20 kids are gonna get instruction at a level more appropriate to where they are this year. And so those are the things that I advocate for because if we continue pushing kids through, it's not gonna happen. And if we continue to, to put kids in classrooms at these schools without teachers in there, we're, there's not gonna be growth. You can have the most wonderful school improvement plan, but if you don't have someone implementing a lesson that knows what they're doing, it's useless. And so I am begging you guys to, to let's figure out what to do about that. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. So we're talking about evidence of implementation, evidence of impact, and I completely agree with that. I am a data person. Show me the data, show me the evidence. And so um, last year we were getting a monthly ABC report and I hope that that will continue. I don't think quarterly is enough. Even our students are getting a progress report once every four and a half weeks. It's about a month, right? Um, so I, I wanna continue to see that. Um, and see, I know fast data doesn't come in that right. that frequently, so we get a lot of A and B and not a lot of C. What internal progress monitoring assessments can we possibly add to our C so that we get a more frequent update? And I see Ms. Leinenbach nodding because we're data people, show us the data. And we know that we have lots of um, more frequent assessments that we give that aren't fast. Um, my, my other show me the data piece is, okay, we brought in BSA, we did school improvement planning differently. What is the outcome data for that? Like, do we have some sort of rating, rating system for our school improvement plans where we can show that they're better? Do we have some sort of maybe survey tool that we can give to administrators or the school advisory committees where they can say, yes, this was a better process. Yes, we appreciated this. This went well, this didn't. Again, I'm all about the data. And so we're doing things differently. Yes, that's great. We need to do things differently because as Ms. Certain likes to point out, if we do the same thing, we're gonna get the same results. So doing things differently is great, but how do we know that different is better, right? Well, Yes, Dr. Rockwell, we did do that. We actually provided surveys. Um, that was important to me. I made sure that um, before the school leaders left, they completed a survey, just exactly what you're saying. Um, what was this experience like? This is a new experience for them, and we wanted to get the feedback as a part of our continuous improvement, right? And so the SI principals as well as the EDs did collect that survey data from each principal um, in that room um, as a part of our continuous improvement process. Um, and just as far as the feedback from the, um, from, the S, um, from the school improvement plans, they are gonna get the feedback from the EDs as well as Ms. Hutchinson and um, Ms. Leinebach. Um, this year, we will be implementing district-wide curriculum-based assessments um, in order to ensure that we are monitoring what our subgroups are doing. We need to make sure that we have a little bit more frequent um, 
assessments and to get that data timely so that we can change up instruction. We've not had it where the entire district um, was using those um, curriculum-based assessments, but it does help us to do district comparisons across schools. It helps us to look at subgroups across schools as well. So yes, we will be doing um, uh, curriculum-based assessments um, in order to make sure that data truly is the focus of driving that instruction in the classroom for our students. That's fantastic, and with those curriculum-based assessments, um, I, I must, I'm going to assume that we're working with student services so that those can be used as um, our RTI data, you know, because I've, I've heard situations where a teacher was doing their own curriculum-based assessments, not something no, district-wide, and they bring it and the EPT says, no, 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 we need six weeks of this other type of data, so if we can use the same data, Yes, these curriculum-based assessments um, will not be teacher-created. Um, they will be aligned to standards taught uh, in the classroom. And just going to what you're saying, that is another thing that we're focusing on this year, providing additional support with MTSS, um, because you're right, they need support with RTI, what that looks like, and using data to really provide those interventions for our students. But just not that, but just looking at what that pyramid looks like. We're looking at core instruction instruction being strong in the classrooms, and if we don't have at least 80% of our students or above being successful at core, that's a core concern. That's not an intervention, that's a core concern. So you're right, that's another thing that we're going to be doing, um, working with the partnerships we have with UC, USF um, to provide additional MTSS training for our um, teachers. Um, we will also be working with and leveraging the par partnership with Fittler to provide additional UDL training as well to ensure that teachers have the tools that they need to support students in the classroom, not just our students with disabilities, but all students in learning profiles in classrooms. And so that's another uh, thing that we will be doing to support teaching and learning within the classrooms. Thank you, those are all good updates. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to look and, because um, I touched on some of those. Excuse me, just. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Dr. McNeely. Mr. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Rowe, I have a question because my colleague, uh, Abbott, who I sit next to and who she's been so funny with me today, I want us to still have that same relationship when I say this. But with the retention of the kids and you, and Mrs. Hutchison and Ms. Leinbach, you all have been administrators. And so my question comes back to the three of you is when you have the 20 retained students, I know when I would sit with my parents who had students to have to be retained, the first question came out of their mouths, what's going to be different than what they had this year and whether or not we're doing mid-assessments, mid where they might have gained enough proficiency and gained scores to move on to the next grade. I don't know if we still do that in this district, but it's important because unless you have somebody who's really supporting and not a sub teacher, these children feel useless and hopeless when they are not getting any further along, but yet we hold them back a full year. Do we still have that progress in place where if tested uh, or mid-year assessment that they could move on still and have not have to stay for a full year in the same grade and then not showing improvement? We do have mid-year promotion options. Um, that's still a part of our progression, um, but that would, you know, teachers and school leaders would have to ensure that those students are showing mastery of those standards, um, you know, for that mid-year promotion. Um, and are these kids having the extra type, if they are at a Title I school, the small groups that are pulled out for those hours of instruction weekly? 
I'm sorry, Dr. McNeely, repeat you know, that question. When again. you have your Title I groups mm -hmm. in place in your, I'm talking mm -hmm. elementary now, right. mm -hmm. uh, and they may pull out four children who need this extra support. Is that still going on as well? Yes, Title I intervention is still available in our schools. Um, I will say that one of our strategies we're really looking at, and those um, interventions will take place, but we wanna make sure that we have, students have access to strong grade level core as well. Um, another strategy that we're doing this year is looking at our curriculum map and filling in some of those standards in which we could look at um, from the previous year in which uh, a majority, great deal amount of our students did not master, placing those on the curriculum map so that teachers can see those standards along with the grade grade level standard and be able to backfill some of that during instruction. Um, the idea is for us to continue to acceler accelerate without pulling with the mindset um, of just remediating. We're wanting to make sure that students are still accelerating their learning um, while also addressing some of the unfinished learning that may have happened from the previous year. So that is another thing that we're doing as far as pulling the TSAs to begin that work to look at the curriculum maps to um, include those standards that we know students still will need instruction with. Doesn't mean that every classroom will need to do it, but it does mean that if we're looking at dat data across our district, these were some of our um, standards in which we know that students may still need some additional support with. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I was kind of cut off and I didn't get my question. I just read back through my notes. So I wanted, I was asking like what was gonna be measured with, you said there was a, I wrote down common district walkthrough tool and Dr. Atria tried to help me with that. So when I hear tool, and you're gonna be looking for trends of implementation, like what's gonna be measured on that tool? Like how, what are we gonna be looking for? Cause y'all know I did a whole lot of these walkthroughs with y'all and I don't profess to be any type of educator. I just been there in the room so I could yeah. see it for myself. So just tell me, and if I was to make an appointment to come and sit with you all and you all show me some of these, these common walkthrough tools that have been filled out for different schools. It may be a school that I'm not, if I don't, I'm going to Idlewild still, but that I don't see. Tell me what will be measured on these tools, some of the things that, that that's, I'm, I'm just waiting, I'm gonna be quiet. Oh yeah, well, <laughs> I can definitely answer. Um, so I think it's similar to when you've gone into, and we've done walks in our, um, some of our SI schools. So when we are walking into those classrooms, we are identifying s certain things to look for. So if I'm walking into a classroom, um, Ms. Leinenbach, uh, Ms. Hutchison and the, and the EDs, we can identify what we're looking for as across the district. So I, we can say, let's go in and let's use the tool to look for implementation of core curriculum. We can go in, we will use that tool, we can come back, we can look for trends across the district. We can use the tool to do a comprehensive walk as well and look at strategies across the board in all content areas. The tool is flexible, so it's not that we would say we're gonna use the tool in the same way at all times. We may go in and we may wanna look, use the tool to just talk to students about learning. Were students able to articulate um, the learning goal for that day. This, this, the tool is very flexible, so I don't wanna give the impression that we'd um, go in and we'd have the same focus every time we're walking into a classroom. So it's not something as linear as that. Um, and I say walkthrough tool, um, Ms. Certain, because typically when we're going into classrooms, and if you can think back to going into the SI schools, uh, you have your own list and you're writing things down and I have my own list and I'm writing things down. But if you had a common tool that you can say, these are the things that we're looking for, then we know that eyes are on that same thing. Now, it doesn't mean that your eyes won't be on other things and you may want to, to record that as well, but we know that the data that we're collecting is, is, is uniform. If, if I may add to that to help understand um, when we walk into a classroom, before we, if we're walking in as a group, the, one of the very first things we do before we enter the classroom is we have a conversation. What exactly are we looking for? What's the look for? And then what does that look for look like in action? I can give you an example. So let's, maybe we're walking into an elementary school and there seems to be some 
challenges with smooth transitions between activities. So we have a conversation. What does a smooth transition look like? What should be the characteristics? How many seconds should it take? How many reminders must the teacher give? How many students should we see engaged at the end of that transition, et cetera? And that's the only thing, as Ms. Roll mentioned, that we would be looking for. So for that particular school, that's what we want to look for. When we talk about a tool, it's really just a data collection instrument that can be used in various different ways depending on the type of data that we're collecting in, in any school, in any classroom. If we're looking at something across the district, maybe what we want to find out is uh, are the ways in which teachers engage students in answering questions. So we're going in and we're looking at the managing response rates. What kind of techniques are they using across the district and what do we notice about the numbers and the kinds of ways in which students engage with those, with those techniques. I'm not sure if that was helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not being negative or anything. I just, it, it all you sounds like it. On you. No, it all sounds, it all sounds like what I've been seeing when I go into, honestly, if I bring my, my tablet to my papers that I keep mm -hmm. my notes on and I look, I'm, I'm not an educator, so I'm, I, I, y'all in a league and I have the utmost respect for y'all. But I have things that I, you know, when they talk to us before we go out in the classroom. So I, I like, I'm, I ain't trying to minimize none of y'all work, so I'm gonna be quiet, so go ahead. Well, if I can expand on that. <laughs> Ms. Abbott, no, if you um, can indulge me just for one more minute, because I think sometimes what happens when we do those walkthroughs is we don't then come back together and have a conversation with both either the teachers and or the leaders in that school about what we found and what it means, how it can be interpreted, and how we can improve. I think sometimes that's where we fall short. We collect the data, but we don't have the continuing conversation. So in terms of that, that tool, if we're all using the same tool, we all know what we're looking for, what it looks like, we collect that data, and then we do have that debrief meeting, and that's part of that planning and that data, so, uh, that, I'm sorry, that improvement that we're looking for. So principle X, this is what we, what we noticed about this particular instructional practice piece. The next time these are some strategies that we can talk about that will improve what's happening for students the next time we come. We should see those being implemented and we should then see improvement in what's happening for students. And then with that collection of that, if when we see those district-wide district trends, we'll be bringing that back to our, our administrative meetings, our assistant principals. Um, it'll drive what we're gonna do with them because some will be school-specific, some will be district-wide where we see some issues that we can challenge um, the work, push back, and work with that collectively as a group in those meetings with small group breakouts, focusing on specific problems uh, that we see and how we can fix that uh, uniformly when it comes to district-wide challenges. That's right, Mr. Andrew, because currently we really don't have a way to direct professional learning in our district, right? And so we can use this tool to direct professional learning as well. Um, the tool has multiple um, uh, purposes um, for its use, but we just have not had a way to do that across our district in order to direct support to schools, teachers um, across our district. And it's, it is a new process, um, Ms. Certain, but it is a process that I think would um, definitely greatly benefit our district um, and our teachers and our school leaders. And so what I was going to say is, like, who is responsible then when you go through this year? I'm not talking about previous years, but who's responsible for um, uh, if there are deficiencies that are seen when you're doing these walkthroughs? Who's responsible for ensuring that the teacher um, understands what needs to be done correctly and monitoring that it is being done? Is that the principal or is it... Uh, Ultimately, extraneous staff that pushes in? Ultimately, it's the school leader, and it goes right back to what Dr. Atria said. Teacher is the chief differentiator between a student that can do well and, and may not meet end of year um, outcomes, but second to that, it is the school leader. So that's why we're making sure that we're providing our school leaders with um, additional professional learning this year, um, changing the way that we're doing our um, principals meeting. We started that last year. We'll, we'll continue to build upon that. That's, what, that's another example of not necessarily something that's new, but something that we will continue to revise and to deepen and provide additional supports for our school leaders. But 
it is the school leader that is ultimately responsible um, for ensuring that those practices are being changed. We will, from the district level, provide supports, um, supports from the executive directors, supports from the turnaround principals, support from TC TSAs, yes. Um, but ultimately, it does go back to the school leader to ensure that these practices are being implemented. But both you and Ms. Leinenbach know that that's exactly what was done in SI schools last yes, year. I mean, we did, we did the exact same thing. We'd go through the schools, we'd talk before we went in, we'd decide these are what we're gonna look for, we'd go in, we look, and then we come back, the principal was present, we'd say, okay, these are the things we need to work on, and, and not much changed. And so, so there, it, there, there has to be, there has to be more to it, and, and, and I, don't, I don't even know what more to it needs to be done, but it's, it, 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 that wasn't effective. I, I, um, I, had, I had just skipped, I, so I can't talk to my colleague outside of the building here, so when I, when I was, I mean, like, we can talk, but you know what I'm saying. So one, after one meeting, I asked, I said, how do we judge the effectiveness of the turnaround principle? Because I just wanted to know. That was two new spots that was put in. Because I didn't see it. I didn't see anything different. Like, I started going to those walkthrough meetings at schools and like, as a result of two events that happened. And so I'm no expert, but I just was, was, was basing it on what I had seen from year to year. Like, this, I started my first year in, and so I'm frustrated that I, because I, what I'm hearing here, and Dr. Atria, thank you for trying to explain it. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. I'm, I just, I was asking, like, what is the evidence that we're going to know that this is going to do better than, than what we did last year because what you described, what she described, I've seen that since I, since 20, I came on in November of 18 and then 20, 2019, that school year, the next year, 2019, 2020 is when I started going to the meetings because of something, Ms. Hutchison and Ms. Ms. Wakely of an incident with them, I started going and I just, I've just seen the same model and I ask, okay, so how do you, do you have authority to tell this principal that this isn't working? And you, we, we see the evidence of it because the kids hadn't done, done better. And who's going to push down to the teacher so we can change the practice and we can do better. So that's in a school, teach, uh, in an environment where the teacher is, but we got one where there is no teacher. I don't know, I didn't go to your school, so I'm, I can't um, say how yours was. So I, I, was, I was going to Terwilliger, and I can say that I did see a change from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year. Um, part of that was that a TSA was assigned not to a classroom, but to the school to support a number of beginning teachers, alt certified teachers, and long-term subs who were in classrooms. And so that TSA was able to push in and co-teach, help plan lessons. And so that one TSA was supporting probably 120 kids at that school. Does that, um, that's, that was my guesstimate. And, but I mean, she was assigned permanently to that school. So she wasn't, you know, here at the district office. She was in classrooms with teachers, doing model lessons, planning, developing relationships with the students so that she knew what they would need. Um, and I saw massive growth in teachers. I mean, I observed a long-term sub at Terwilliger who, if I didn't know she was a long-term sub and had only gone to the third walkthrough, I would have thought that she was an experienced veteran teacher. But the first walkthrough was not like that. The second walkthrough was better, but still not great. But I mean, I observed impressive growth right. um, because of those services. The, the issue is, I'm not sure how much of it translated to student outcomes. So like on a walkthrough tool, we would have seen, oh my gosh, like this teacher's classroom management improved, her instructional delivery improved, her use of group work improved, her use of manipulatives improved, and we could see all these different instructional areas that would show up on, a, on an observation tool, which people in education, we've used various ones, and they have all these different categories of things, and you would see major improvement, but the question is, we know theoretically from research that all of these instructional practices should translate to student improvement. The question is, do they? And if they don't, why not? What, what else is happening? Um, 
At the end of the school year last year, I think Mr. Gilfilland provided for you all um, the ABC report and the end of year data anal analysis for all of our SI schools as well as schools across the data, I mean across the district. And there was impact uh, when you looked at that data. I mean, if you go back and look at that uh, report, you will have seen that there was impact. We saw um, gains in proficiency um, in all of our schools, um, some more so than others. And we, although this year, um, last year rather, uh, the state um, did not have a learning gains model, when he put that learning gains and looked at the average gains across our district from PM1 to PM3, and he kind of, he showed it through the visualization, the average learning gains, what you saw were some of our SI schools leading the pack on that. Um, so if you go back to that data, you will be able to see, you will be able to see that. Yeah. Um, Ms. Leinenbach, did you want to talk about it? Well, and I know with Terwilliger, at least the PM2 scores were were scary. We were we were worried, we were very worried, and PM3 was was better than we were expecting. And I'm sure part of that was because of assigning that TSA to that school to provide that support. So I'm not, I'm not sh saying that there wasn't an impact, but we still have students. Right. who are underperforming. And so what else can we do is more the question. So the growth model, the previous growth model, and I, I know we are in, we have new standards, and but previous, previously when we had the growth model from the state, if you would know, there was level one, and there were three buckets in level one. There were level two, two buckets in level two. If we were meeting the growth model each year, that means that we were moving students towards proficiency. So what we were trying to do is to make sure, according to each year, each student needed to make that jump from the next bucket to the next bucket because if if we did that, then we would be closing gaps. Some students would do it uh, one bucket per year, but some students would make um, larger growths, um, larger jumps. But that's how you close the gaps, looking you know, where the student is and then giving, having that growth model and making sure that they're making that expected growth each year. So there's a couple of things that you said that I'd love to jump in and, and add a few things to. I think one of the biggest um, differences moving forward, and you are going to see a duplication of efforts that we started this past year, but one of those things that you're going to see is um, that may be new to, to some schools is that we're going to triangulate the data. So I know, um, Dr. Rockwell, you were specifically speaking about walk-through data may show improvements, but it may not translate to students. Um, research shows that the translation to students is a little bit slower, unfortunately. However, um, that triangulation of walk-through data, student results data, and when you're talking student result data, you're also talking about um, that proficiency, how well am I doing on grade level expectations and standards and benchmarks, but you're also talking about what are my foundational levels. And so we're triangulating all of those components to say, what does the student need still, and where can we fill in and make sure that they're receiving it? That's one of the reasons Ms. Roll um, spoke about the inclusion in our curriculum maps, the, you know, the, the prerequisite skills that may be lacking due to either I haven't learned them yet or they weren't taught yet, even though they should be. Um, I think one thing that hasn't been said so far is that the implementation of best standards or benchmarks, there are gaps vertically because we shifted standards. And so typically a third grade student in the past would have been expected to do a certain uh, skill. When we shifted to best, um, it may have been skipped over because of the transition to the standards. So that's another piece that has nothing to do with teaching and learning or students' ability. It just literally was skipped because we shifted into different standards. In terms of outcomes, um, all of our SI schools did growth-wise outperform um, many of our traditional and non-SI schools. Um, had growth been included in the uh, school grades, and of course we're still waiting to see what that looks like, um, but preliminarily at least three, if not four of the seven would, would have been pulled out um, very close and three of them without growth, which is a tribute to the leadership at the school level and the teachers and of course the families and students that were a part of that. 
Um, so we're real proud of that. Um, that and that was shared at the last, I think the June 2nd maybe, or June 1st, like the last uh, board meeting um, with the ABC report. So um, there was growth in those schools, um, um, proficiency um, in those areas in which um, some, I think we had at least one school that almost doubled proficiency for that, um, for last year, but you know, there's a lot of work to be done. So it's not to say that that work doesn't um, continue, but um, it is true that we need to celebrate the hard work for those school leaders and those teachers last year um, that worked really hard to ensure better outcomes for those students in those buildings. If I may, one more thing is to recall as well, the starting place, that equity practice um, our turnaround schools, our, our students are not starting at the same, it's not an even playing field. And so it's really important to remember that when you have 0% proficient at the beginning of the school year, and at the end of the year you may be at 25, 28% proficient, that's still, you know, it's growth. Do we have some additional work to do? Yes. It's still this is, a, this is a random question. Has the district received the formula from the state for calculating the school grades? Uh, for, you mean the, the eight cells for the upcoming school year that's going to include the third grade reading off to itself? Mm, for last year. No, we don't, we have not found out anything related to what that's going to look like as far as the scale scores and, and those types of things. I think we're projected to get that maybe around October, November of this year. And that's it for my updates. Um, All right. I think I'm on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Roll, Mrs. Leinenbach, Dr. Atri, and our team for the robust discussion. I know that um, Dr. Edwards has a hard stop at five, so we want to jump right into her sharing and presentation at this time. We can move forward with the discussion after five, but you'll have to depart. Fill in for student services if need be. Um, so <clears throat> board certain board members, board chair certain board members and superintendent, which I failed to do earlier, so sorry for not acknowledging you in that way. Um, the updates for ESC student services. First and foremost, during this summer, we had a Summer Behavior Institute where all of our schools um, had teams that came out for training. We trained nearly 250 people um, that was inclusive of our school administrators and a principal, an AP, a BERT or dean, a school counselor, three teachers, and the PBIS um, team members. Um, we had a PD day today that was concentrated on behavior, which was an extension of that training um, from eight to three today. And so the same materials and information that were shared with um, those teams during the summer was shared today with um, all of our faculties across the district. At three o'clock this afternoon, there was a uh, live, um, or our website went live for behavior. The important piece about all of this training is that it was to make consistent our tier one practices throughout the district. Um, we have had some inconsistencies as it relates to the practices and how people are following those. And so within the website, um, and you all have had the access so you know that those pillars that we have outlined, it was really to make sure that we had common language among all of our schools and an understanding about the practices that needed to be followed and having schools to walk through and look at who needs to be responsible for each of the pieces as we move into processes for progress monitoring um, uh, behavior. Um, we also, as was indicated uh, earlier on, had our ISD training in January of 2023, but are moving in this school year to do walkthroughs in those in-school detentions, cl um, classrooms. And so um, the intention, and all principals are aware, is that we would have our district staff uh, visiting school campuses and our uh, ISD models to ensure that academic opportunities are existing within our ISD classrooms so that students who are removed from instructional space still have opportunities um, to continue learning. Um, we are 
in our summer training. Um, in each one of the trainings that we held, they were two days each, two full work days. Um, and on the second day of each of the six trainings that we held, um, we had River Phoenix for Peace Building share uh, in restorative practices, and we are working now to see how we can um, continue some of the restorative practices trainings with individual schools. Um, and Aquin Jones, we are working on an orientation process for entry um, and exit and would be using our alternative learning center in addition to how we have used it in this past year and previous years to um, allow for students who have been removed from their um, school while they're awaiting placement at Aquin Jones and the orientation to be completed to be served so that they are continuing um, their academic and learning experiences at the Alternative Learning Center. It also, in this previous year, was used to um, provide supports for Aquin Jones at the end of the year when we had um, some increased numbers of students who were um, actually being moved to Aquin and those were supported by ALC and we would continue to do that. Uh, Aquin Jones itself, um, as we've looked at the, um, the schedule for the school, is also um, moving towards having a more CTE focus with at least one class where they would focus on more entrepreneurial um, types of uh, focus for students and giving them that chance. So I know that Ms. Ritter has been working uh, with Ms. Bing and the team there to um, develop some opportunities for students um, that go beyond the traditional education and then actually having some support as they've built out their schedule to make sure that we don't have classrooms where there were minimal numbers of students where there may have been one, three, or five kids in one class, but we have 12 in another. And so just making sure that we are maximizing the class in shadow scheduling if necessary or where possible um, in, that, in that space. Um, in this upcoming school year, it is my intent to also um, spend more time visiting in classrooms and meeting with our APAs and APSSs, our Assistant Principals of Administration and Student Services, um, to look at the implementation of those things that were shared during training. And so to have conversations with those Assistant Principals about behavior, um, what those outcomes are, how are the strategy, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, strategies being outlined and implemented within the school that are aligned with ISIL, <coughs> excuse me, our instruction curriculum, environment and learner, our MTSS, multi-tiered system of supports, PBIS, which is our positive behavior interventions and systems, and the core. <coughs> Excuse me, may I should drink water. <laughs> um, and so really just moving into this year, trying to focus more on progress monitoring so that we've had the training, we have the common language, but then being able to do those uh, checkups and to see that we are on target and that people are actually <clears throat> outlining their strategies. <clears throat> Excuse me, going back to the institute and the teams from each of those schools had to submit um, what were their actual targets for MTSS and what were their actual numbers at their schools and the tier one interventions that are currently being used at the schools. Today they had to do um, or submit a focus for um, the area of focus for behavior for each one of their schools and to look at those four pillars that I just mentioned um, for our district and submit those in terms of their plans so that when we're able to wrap back around and um, when the curriculum department is working with principals on the school improvement plan, that those things are able to be aligned. Um, something I think that is a little different is um, the probably number of conversations that have already taken place in us being very intentional about having student services and curriculum um, work together in the planning of um, support that goes out to schools to make sure that as we're addressing academic needs that behavior is inclusive and vice versa. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for we are something different as well this year is um, outposts. We do not intend on renewing the outpost MOU. Um, and so that um, 
is where we ha had the agreement uh, with the city for that additional staff member who is over at Aquin Jones. We believe that we can provide those supports, but even if um, we needed to expand it, we would rather have our own um, position that is dedicated to that, and it would save a lot of um, money financially for us, but there's just been some inconsistencies and in late reporting and things like that on year after year, and so we have opted to um, not move forward. Uh, our counseling and mental right health. There is, I'm sorry, what's the cost on Outpost? Do you have it in your notes? 80,000 approximately. And we can, would you say we can do better with our own staffing with that? Or well, we have them on and you can direct them or whatever. Well, what we do is we, we're paying the salary basically for that one individual that comes across and then for the curriculum and things and um, the other supports that they're providing. But if we had paid the salary of that person ourselves, we would sig save a significant amount. Um, and we can have those requirements as it, for a position with an individual who's an employee for us where we don't have to do all of those additional things. It's just, it's not cost effective um, for us, there are some some benefits and things that have happened, you know, after school um, and being able to do home visits, for instance. But the reporting, the timeliness of it, typically in the last couple of years, we have not gotten invoices. They're supposed to come monthly until July after the fiscal year um, has closed or we'll get a, a group at once. So there's just some concerns that exist. <laughs> Um, our counseling and mental health supports, um, we are moving our social workers to serve under one director this year, and so they will be um, assigned to schools um, as they're looking at now based on the needs of the schools, not necessarily just having one person assigned to a school and making it equal, but based on um, the severity of needs of schools. Um, we have also... Um, we're waiting to hear back whether we are approved through Title IV, have written to have two additional social workers, wherein they would serve directly uh, Aquin Jones and Sydney Lanier with Character Counts Program, um, so that those additional supports are at those sites. Um, we are continuing with our Cook Foundation agreement with parentguidance.org. We served about 200 um, families in this past year and are looking to expand um, the services and support that is offered with parentguidance.org. Um, we had in our ESSER agreements or amendments um, the Beyond the Bell for School Counseling Services, and so we are looking to create the schedule to bring school counselors who um, can provide additional services outside of the school day virtually, um, but we have also looked at opportunities that might exist with some personnel who um, previous who have school counseling certification or have served as school counselors who may no longer be doing that but have LLCs to do other things to work with parents and things like that to provide additional support. Um, we are increasing the number of calm rooms um, in our schools. Uh, Fort Clark has an opening on next week, but we're also um, working with Optum to have additional calm rooms and spaces. And we know that some of our elementary schools have calm corners. Um, I think there are two to three that have them school-wide. And so during our um, summer institute, we talked about how that can be expanded um, in other schools and those supports exist to give students opportunities to reset and restart within the classroom setting. We will um, also continue to move forward with providing training and support for Spanish language training within our schools with front office staff, um, school guidance um, or school counseling services and guidance support or what have you. Um, in our health services, we lost a couple of our health techs due to ESSER, but we have um, been able to sh um, send out and deploy some of staff to Littlewood and Lanier and are looking at the needs of our ESC students at schools um, where we're also providing two float nurses to serve as substitutes and making sure that that information or those um, positions are there to support where there might be, um, you know, people not in place. Um, in as serving as our um, our techs and nurses. And so those um, have moved, those float nurses, from ESSER to IDEA, and so they're being covered um, that way financially. 
Um, we are also um, looking to have student services meetings in a different format this year where um, we would be reviewing as a whole team, district-wide student services team, reviewing um, the feedback that has come from the student services team at each of our schools and what is being deemed as um, priority needs for those schools in tier three concerns, where we can look at that holistically as a group and know exactly what we might um, be able to do to provide additional supports to schools and get that feedback right away so that we are not all individually running to various crises. And so it's trying to streamline that price process and work together as a team to address those needs. Um, as you all know, we had previously posted our um, position for Director of Student Services and Director of ESE to be two positions. We know that financially that is um, more than currently we have with our Executive Director and happy to have Ms. Black um, with us for another year. However, our department is um, organized to flow into a space where we would have two different directors. So the organizational chart within ESE Student Services is separated out where staff are clearly can be identified under the two director positions. So at which time um, that, that we're able to move in that direction, it would be an easy flow because we're organized in that manner now. Um, we have some potential partnerships that we're looking at with UF psych, um, Psychiatry, uh, with the BCBAs, with the Genesis Foundation with, um, that focuses on neurosequential model, the Habitudes program that was approved um, to provide supports virtually um, for counseling, um, especially in our rural areas, and I've already mentioned Optum, as well as the meetings that we've been having with the County, City, and Children's Trust on children's mental health. Um, under our equity office, uh, educational equity, um, as I mentioned before, we are working with our curriculum department and are trying to really centralize and focus the efforts of um, the equity office because it is so small. Um, having basically just Dr. Graham and um, secretarial staff and parent academy. And so with that being said, um, we are working with curriculum to have him um, provide supports with either our TSI or ATSI schools and Title I, and we'll have a list of those schools where he would be able to push in and provide direct supports to schools, also looking at the data for the subgroups um, as schools across the district, um, ensuring that those schools are showing evidence of the core. And so when we look at the core foundations that have been uh, focused for last year and this year, the two that we are focused on are um, caring relationships and clear academic goals. And so there are some expectations of our school leaders as it relates to having evidence. There are tools that have been provided for them. And so um, this year, the goal is to provide a schedule to our administrators to share when he would be coming in and to work um, with teams. Last year, what we were doing is making requests and asking, and so there were some ask and some not, and it was very inconsistent. And so this year, um, the intention is to just have a schedule and all schools will have that opportunity to uh, be visited. Um, and we are continuing on with the focus of Amplified to raise um, student voice. We did recognize that when we sent the survey out to our rising ninth through 12th grade students, that we had about 40 surveys returned by students in high school. However, they were by and large students who were in magnet programs and um, had good GPA, so on and so forth. It was not representative of all of our students around the district. So we're looking at visiting our high schools kind of during lunch, having opportunities to see children face to face and talk to them about the opportunity to, to join Amplified. And then as we move forward to DELT, which is our district equity leadership team, um, we last year, month by month, looked at each of our departments throughout the district and talked about um, the various ways um, of equitable practices across um, the district and knowing that we can't do everything at once, our team um, agreed and um, that we would move forward and, and focus in one area for the 23-24 year. And so that area for this upcoming year would be HR. And so we are going to be meeting with um, Mr. Shelna and Ms. Eunice um, to talk about 
um, what they may see as some of those priorities, things that we talked about as a summary from the DELT meetings and then how we would move forward. And our meetings this year would be centered around that. Um, for our public information office, we, of course, are working to increase the efforts of volunteers at all of our schools um, and making sure that we're getting um, some more supports and communicating to parents that we're wanting to have volunteers and working with people. Um, I know that Ms. Nunn has been working tirelessly on recruiting efforts for various positions where we've had vacancies um, and being able to set up um, different opportunities for career fairs, but also doing things virtually. Um, she has reached out um, to universities for us due to the counseling vacancies and across the board has just been working on that. Ms. Um, Johnson, <laughs> I was like, that lady there, uh, Jackie Johnson, um, has um, written up the outline for also an attendance campaign for this year. So um, we are working towards having a, a, you know, commercial, social media, and different things to encourage um, families to get their students registered for school, to come to school that we want for them to be present. Um, and I think Outside of um, the one thing that I did forget was about in, in equity, was about Parent Academy, um, was the focus. Um, they're working on schedule and brochures to provide information to parents, but our intentionality is to move from just having the webinars to also having face-to-face -face, um, and mobile unit increases and continuing on with our focus groups um, where we meet um, parents um, at least every nine weeks, different places across the district to be able to receive feedback. And so those are the updates and some of the changes that we have in the areas um, for me. Any questions? So I don't know if you have any quick questions. Um, does anyone, anyone have any quick questions for uh, her words from about the Elvis before she has to leave or Ms. Black is here, I guess? Um, any questions? I, I mean, I don't know how quick it will be, but again, just as we move forward and as you bring us those behavior updates um, on a regular basis, I'm hoping that there will be data to back up whether, you know, is our tier one being implemented? Are the pillars being implemented? Is each school implementing PBIS? You know, just again, that evidence of implementation and impact, that's, that's all. I want as a board member is to see that. That is the goal, that's what we've been discussing and so that, that's what we would look to be bringing to you. Anything else from anyone? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. So um, I was trying to, Mr. Andrew, you could help me. I was trying, or somebody on your team helped me. I was trying to write down the priorities that would weave through all of them. I know we want kids in school, attendance is good, but three things that we're gonna measure and we're gonna be able to look back on and say that we did well this year or that when I go talk to Mr. Um, Burkett or when we have another meet, the special budget meeting and we can say that we're, our, we're directing our financial resources or we're doing this, this is our focus. I, I, I took a lot of notes, but I can't pull it out. So if it's something, we've been here for a while, I know my colleagues ready for me to go, they probably like, no you didn't just throw that out there, but um, just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, because we gotta come up with some evaluation criteria for you as superintendent, because we have to do that yearly, and we haven't done that. So that is, uh, you've given us this start here, um, what the update on the start of the new year, and I tried to, to get a, a common thread between all of them, and I, I got an update on what, what's happening and what, you know, we want students to improve, but I haven't, I didn't hear like some specific things that will do that. So that is something that I want you to, to kind of, you to think about and to bring back to us. I'm gonna say probably if not the next board meeting, I would, or for sure the first meeting in September. So uh, if, unless you got it ready to give it to us right now, I mean, since. Well, the common themes, as you heard today, <clears throat> excuse me, is accelerating achievement for all. And so um, achievement definitely has to be one of those. And as far as goals that we've set together, attendance, and then we're focusing on supports for students uh, it, when it comes into the student services realm, and that can be discipline, mental health, um, our ESE students, everybody across the board there. So 
Um, you know, I think all means all, as we have said, and that's our focus is, is to accelerate achievement for all students, support all students, no matter what it might be, whether it's um, our LGBTQ plus students, to our ESE students, to our athletes, to everybody, top to bottom, regardless of what subgroup they're in, and um, regardless of their gender identity, we want to support all kids. So I think that's truly the focus, and and um, always safety. I didn't start with that, but that's that's as well an area of focus. And I think we're building a team there in our office of safe schools that is gonna be the best in the state, quite frankly. And so um, I'm excited about the new team of leaders that are coming together. I'm optimistic. Uh, I, I appreciate the passion of the school board. I appreciate the pressure, the push uh, that we wanted yesterday. And, and we do too, and, and we need that. That's a healthy environment to work in. I do wanna celebrate all of our employees and just thank everyone that stayed with us last year and you saw uh, we're getting closer to 500 every day of the number of employees we've hired which is over 10 percent of our workforce um so those that have enjoyed that have uh, joined our family as instructional members this year and as non-instructional employees we're grateful as well as the administrators that have joined our school district in uh, what i would consider the most trying of times in public education that our nation has faced so um, those would be areas that I would certainly look to Im continue our improvement in and that could be measured. And I do think, Dr. Atrey, you had a couple items that you wanted to share with us briefly. Before you start, can I ask one question I didn't? Um, you fly, I didn't hear anybody speak of that. Is that still a district-wide initiative? I mean, I... It is, and part of, uh, back to what you requested, Dr. Rockwell, or a whole board, is as we're bringing monthly updates, we may not have monthly you know, information from PM1, 2, and 3, but we'll certainly gather UFLY updates, dibbles, all the measurements that we're using our, our uh, school district-based curriculum measures. So we're going to work on bringing that data, you know, as we present those monthly. And as you know, sometimes there's not a lot of changes. Sometimes there are quite a few changes. So we're going to try to put our hands on every piece of data achievement wise that we can share with you all and continue to bring the attendance and discipline data. Thank you. Did you have something Dr. Rockwell? Um, yes. Um, you know, as Mr. Andrew mentioned, a focus on student services and that meeting all students. Um, I'd like to request that we reserve space on the next board meeting agenda to bring an update, hopefully a draft of a revised LGBTQ guide. All right, I will talk to Dr. Edwards about that. I know with the state board rule, there's we're working on different things. The, the one state board rule, I believe is gonna take effect 20 days from today, or was it? August 22nd, yes. Yeah, the 22nd, did you, understand that is your is that your understanding mr delaney that it was submitted like one of the steps today that in 20 days it'll take effect and that was the one particularly on pronouns right AKA. yes sir thank you and we've worked on guidance for aka processes for our school administrators that we're getting out and we'll be sharing all of that with you um but we've sent out some guidance on and we're working with kim neal we're working with our whole team, but how we're working on the form in Skyward and how that changes there and how that is uh, then produced on rosters for substitutes. So the AK name can be on those rosters. We're working through all that process right now too. And we've been in communication and having Zoom meetings with our administrators. Um, I asked, had a short combo with Attorney Delaney before the meeting because we've gotten several emails on the PragerU curriculum. I know it's free. So I don't know, maybe um, the suggestion is, is that principals let parents know if teachers plan to use that because some parents may have take issue with that. And um, so I think the principals need to poll their teachers and if that's something they're gonna do to they notify parents from that about that. 
Madam Chair, thank you for the question. I think Mr. Andrew is looking for a communication that we have just put together yesterday and we're preparing to send out to principals and to teachers and to ad other administrators regarding PragerU. Last night was a lengthy meeting. I have a few papers from last night. Um, but we have just, we've worked on that. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna put my hands on it here. Plenty of, of uh, information, but as we mentioned, we've sent out, just so you know, we've sent out um, some information on AK names, on um, district, okay, we'll make sure, and, and our plan is to share everything with the board as well. Uh, we revised some of how we're gonna report weapons and all of those protocols, so we've done some procedural things there, too, as far as our school administrators, so we're um, reporting everything the exact same way. And give me one second, because I definitely have it here. Um, and I wanted to read it into the record. Sure. But I'm, gonna, I'm gonna suggest against that if you if it's not final yet instead of reading it into the record. Okay, but uh, we do have a draft. Okay, and, yeah. And I just I mean I just think parents should be notified so I can come up and, and look at it. But before until you get that thing situated where it's ready to go, don't don't read it right, right now. But what I would say that's a fact is the PragerU curriculum occurred post selection, and we've selected our instructional materials and gone through those processes, and we've done you know, our curricular, ma uh, curriculum mapping and all of that. So um, that curriculum is not included in our offerings at this time. So Prager is supplemental and it doesn't go through the same selection process and it's free. So I was, that's why I'm a little bit concerned. It's not, it doesn't go through, I know we did the social studies thing. I had this email thing with Ms. Roll already about that with one parent because I, I know we went through the, so the social studies selection this past school year. But this is free supplemental instructional materials that teachers can use, and it's on a DOE list. And so that makes me think that it's kind of like they, if they want to go pull it down, they can pull it down and incorporate it into a lesson. And I know part of our CBA has um, this academic freedom in it, but I think if my kid was in a classroom with that, just speaking for me, and the teacher's gonna use that, I wanna know, because that's something that I gotta come home, they are gonna come home and I'm gonna have to clean it up, or what they taught, because of some of that stuff on there I don't agree with, so a good bit of it, so. Um, I think it's different, I, I don't wanna, I, it's, I know it's different from the, the process than what we went through this past school year in adopting so, um, social studies curriculum, is why I'm asking. So this is not an adoption, as you stated, it is a, a supplemental material, uh, but we still do have a process that we ask teachers to go through regarding the use of supplemental materials. So um, we'll share this this with you later. Okay, thank you. Once we, before thank we you, finalize Dr. it, yeah. So if, if I can share just the last few things that I had and, and this, uh, these are all related to personnel and the shortages that we are currently facing, certainly not going to solve our problem today, but our hope is to, if we get moving on these, that they will help to solve our problems tomorrow. And one of those is we have um, a meeting scheduled coming up with uh, uh, Ms. Roll and Ms. Nunn with Bloom and Ms. Petty Frere with Bloomboard. They have a program from paraprofessional to professional where an individual can work in a school as a paraprofessional with alongside a highly qualified certified teacher and in a matter of a year or two, depending on how many credits they need to earn, they end up with a degree in elementary education. We have some questions at this point as to who it is that confers the degree, but I think that those questions will be answered with that conversation with Bloom Board. So that's something that we're exploring right now. Another area that we're looking at with um, uh, Dr. Rejoui in grants is there are federal monies that have not yet become available but have been promised for principal apprenticeships. This will help train our assistant principals to be very successful once they're promoted to be principals. Um, through this apprenticeship program, and that will help us align and update our level two program for principal certification, especially in alignment with the new Florida educational leadership standards that are going into effect 
January. Uh, and then I think the last one is that there is state money that, again, Dr. Rejoui is keeping a close eye on one further information regarding this will be released for teachers to earn master's degrees uh, where the state monies will pay for that higher education and that master's degree will then enable them to meet the credentialing process to teach dual enrollment courses on our high school campuses to keep our students on our campuses and provide a greater level of equity and access for all students for dual enrollment programs. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure, it, a couple weeks ago, if y'all saw the FSBA, they had to do Friday webinars. It's the Thursday, third Friday, and they had um, UCF, U, FSU, and those talking about the new Florida Education Leadership Standards and all that training on there. So that slide deck I think was posted if y'all want to look at it. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, I was actually part of uh, those committees that developed the new educational leadership standards and the new evaluation instruments for administrators. I've been working with the State Department of Education for the last five years on those projects. Yeah, okay, that's good. That was, I'm is. not sure what the lady's name. I'm trying to rethink, re recall the name, but I can't. Who was like the who led the little discussion? Mm -hmm. Good, good to know. All right, I don't have anything else. You all, um, Dr. McNeely, Ms. Abbott, Mr. Andrew, you have anything else you want for us? Um, so and that's all on our agenda. We 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 got a citizen. citizen input. Do we have any citizen input? Okay, no, sit, no phone calls, nobody in the auditorium. Um, I, I guess we, yeah, okay, I don't have anything else. Do you have anything, Attorney Delaney? Okay, all right, we're adjourned, thank you. We're adjourned, thank you.